I would like to call to order the January 3rd, 2023 Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners work session. Welcome everyone. Uh, first up is the approval of the work session agenda. Uh, at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda with the changes on page three. Uh, yeah, one, one addition to the agenda also is we did not have a closed session on there, so we would uh, amend that to include a closed session. I'll move to approve the agenda with the addition of the closed session. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And we move now to discussion items. Uh, first up from Cooperative Extension with their annual report is Tracy LeCompte, and it looks like she has brought a uh, crew Everybody. with her. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I failed to mention, as we call the meeting to order, Commissioner Shu is not with us in person tonight, but he is with us via Teams virtually, uh, <coughs> and so he can hear us. He just acknowledged. So proceed, <laughs> Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and Happy New Year. Thank you for having us. Um, we are excited to bring um, our team today to discuss a little bit about what Cooperative Extension did in 2022 and share that information with you all, um, as well as our viewing public as kind of our report to the people for our constituents and shareholders for our program. Um, we are Cooperative Extension, the Cabarrus County Center. There's one of us in every um, county across the state, as well as one at the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. So we have 101 Cooperative Extension Centers across the state. We are proud to serve Cabarrus County. We do only serve Cabarrus County, although like in a lot of our county programs, we have people that come from other counties to get the services that we provide. Um, we are a group of experts who support our growers and producers um, of Cabarrus County. And that basically means that if you grow anything or produce anything, we can help. And so that's beyond what the stereotypical world of agriculture has been in the past. Um, but we do work with all different um, types of growers and producers in the county. We value the resources that Cabarrus County continues to um, allow our department to use. Um, and NCSU, North Carolina State University, and North Carolina A&T State University both support us with um, the intellectual aspect of what we do, connecting to the um, network of professionals across the state and across the nation. And many of our programs are international, so we have 4-H programs and ECA programs and livestock programs um, around the world. And um, our staff travel uh, in all of those places to learn more about how agriculture is done in many other places around the world so we can bring those practices back to uh, Cabarrus County and serve our people here best. So um, in your packets you have an annual report um, and uh, showcasing a little bit about what we've done each um, throughout each one of our programs. I'll let each one of our staff kind of um, give an idea or give an overview of each one of them. Um, I don't know if you are able to share that. Yes. Um, and so and the first page just kind of talks a little bit about what I just talked about, about who we are and some um, fun photos and, and uh, showcases about what we do. We are a inter-serving program as well as an ex, um, external program as well. Um, so we, that means we serve Cabarrus County um, as far as Cabarrus County employees. Um, so Cabco U is one that we do with that, but any kind of professional development and those kind of things, we're able to work with a lot of our departments to serve um, our internal departments as well as doing external programming to serve community members as well. So you'll see that. Um, and then each one of our programs kind of do a highlight for each through each one of them. Um, the first one is our commercial nursery and greenhouse. Um, and 
Our agent for that is Stacy Jones, and she is um, out on leave right now, so she is not able to join us tonight. But I did want to highlight that um, she is actually an area specialized agent, so not all counties have area specialized agents. She is um, an NC State employee who <coughs> is specialized in commercial nurseries and greenhouse productions. Um, so it's really cool to have her on staff. She is a trained entomologist, helps us identify a lot of di different things throughout that. Um, she visits and serves 17 different counties. So she um, makes her home here in Cabarrus County, lives in Concord, serves us um, as a priority. And it's really nice to have her really close and locally. Um, you'll see a couple of the highlights of things that she has done. Um, one of the biggest things in 2022 that she has focused on is the um, stress management in farms. Um, as you guys know, many of the farms in Cabarrus County are aging out and many of our farmers are aging and trying to understand the financial stress of that um, the physical stress of that on an aging body um, and the physical stress on a young body um, and then looking also at the mental and physical um, aspects of that so really understanding the mental health aspect of what it's like to run a family farm with your family members which most of us don't work with a family member on a regular basis but and then if you do you know that that can be a little stressful um, on land and property and and things that have value that everybody might not all have the same ideas of what to do with that for the future. So there's a lot of stress that our um, large farm, large landowners are struggling with. Um, and uh, Stacy has been crucial in, in understanding that and working to bring more of that awareness um, at our level here in the county. Um, next up, we have Mackenzie Hall, who's our livestock and field crops agent. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mackenzie Hall, like Tracy mentioned. Um, I cover livestock and field crops as well as serving as a pesticide coordinator. So this year we are able to get back in swing of things and have an in-person meetings and trainings and programs. Um, a big thing um, with my job is the Cattlemen Association. So we've been able to meet from October through May and their topics, they meet once a month and their topics range from cattle nutrition, um, grazing management, um, and an assortment of any type of thing so anything they're interested in um, I help provide that to them we had a lot of youth involvement with livestock this year with over 50 students participating with livestock related events from judging animals judging food products with actually working hands-on with cattle um, Mount Pleasant High School actually won their regional competition of the cattle working contest which is very exciting they will go on to compete with at the state level we had also 100 individuals attend pesticide trainings to receive continued edu education credits. These consisted of landscapers, county employees, and farmers. We are continuing to look forward through this year through Cattlemen's Meetings, youth programs, as well as multiple pesticide trainings. So thank you for your time. <coughs> And our next one is horticulture, which um, and a short update on that. Today was Morgan Meneker's first day in serving Union County. So he has moved on to Union County um, and we currently have that job posted to bring in a new horticulture agent. Um, we're excited about where that's going. We had a, a very productive master gardener meeting this morning and we are rocking and rolling. So I am serving as um, interim within that world of horticulture right now. Um, Morgan did a great job this year of getting us, um, getting our master gardeners back to their roots, understanding what they were doing and, and getting them rolling <coughs> this year. Um, he left us in a very good place and I feel that they have really good momentum moving forward. Um, Morgan has excellent data on here and you can see um, the thousands of people that he has reached um, serving in our inaugural, well, in one of the first podcasts the county has put on in um, partnership through a lot of different things. Um, Morgan and many of our staff members are involved in um, research uh, at the state and the county and the um, national level of bringing what is going to grow the best here in Cabarrus County or what works the best here in Cabarrus County. And that's really powerful because that is the heart and soul of Extension is taking that um, research then and bringing it back to the people here in Cabarrus County to make everything better um, at this level. Next we have our 4-H youth development and that's Molly Clayman. Hello, um, I would like to uh, explain some things that we've done this year with youth development. I work with the youth um, in Cabarrus County. Um, over the course of 2022, I had the opportunity um, to work with youth who were able to participate in several leadership opportunities at the district and state level. Um, these are really cool opportunities where they get to sit in workshops, learn about um, 
leadership and then hopefully we want them to bring that back to our county and be leaders within the community um, and so that was a great um, showcase this year along with public speaking that's one of our big areas they do um, county activity day then go to district and go to state and a lot of our youth have been able to advance to district to state um, we also um, have a great showcase at the Cabarrus County um, well the Piedmont Farmers Market uh, we have about uh, five to eight youth that participate the second Saturday of each month so if you see them out there that's part of our program it helps them establish a small business we help them with business practices help them um, advertise and so they're out there the second Saturday of each month so we hope we can develop that program even more and youth um, will continue to do that in 2023 um, and so we have a lot of opportunities for youth to continue in 2023 um, to be future leaders um, for 2023. Beverly is next. Hi, Beverly Bollenbecker. I'm the 4-H after school coordinator for Cabarrus County. And imagine if you are an Ian or a Sophia in a 4-H or an after school program and you're in an elementary school and you're waiting for that three o'clock bell to ring and all of a sudden it rings and you jump up and they head down to the Kids Plus after school program. And today is really exciting because it's a 4-H club meeting day and they love to do 4-H curriculum. And today they are doing a uh, kit that's provided by 4-H on making blueberry pancakes. And they're also <laughs> topping it off with real maple syrup. So their teacher is really happy uh, that they are providing this and that we are providing the kit because it has all of the supplies that they need uh, in order to do this cooking program. So this is just one kit of the 250 that we offer our after school programs. So after doing the pancakes, they divide out into um, different program areas and one may work on a service learning project. A group may work on a science experiment to perfect it, to offer it to others at the next 4-H club meeting, or um, they can even do a art project for the 4-H Expressive Arts program, which they had over 600 entries last year in the Expressive Arts program. So this is just one of many meetings that they have throughout the county in the 21 after school sites uh, that offer 4-H after school. And so I am very proud that for over 30 years, we've been able to partner with Cabarrus County and Cabarrus County Schools Kids Plus program to offer 4-H in all 21 after school sites. And also very fortunate to have a Canon Foundation grant where I'm able to offer a part-time position as well uh, to do special programming and to also put together all of those kits uh, to have the financial abilities to do that. So remember when that bell rings that a lot of kids, 1300, are headed down to Kids Plus and are able to participate in 4-H after school. And now we'll transition to Family and Consumer Sciences. I'm Pam Uten, a Family and Consumer Science agent. As you look at the report, you see that 54 food safety questions have been answered. That may be 54 lives that have been saved in Cabarrus County, or they have remained healthy because they were asking about a food safety question or more importantly, a food preservation question. Probably our largest outreach this past year was in our Mediterranean program. And not only did we offer hands-on series of eating the Medway, and Commissioner Misra, your mother attended, and we were <laughs> glad she was there. She was an excellent <laughs> student. But um, they learned the importance of eating a healthy diet, uh, cutting back on salt, eating more fruits and vegetables, eating more uh, white meat rather than beef, lots of little tips. And we know mm -hmm. that we had, through various methods, face-to-face, um, -face, 1,116 contacts regarding eating the Mediterranean way. A big success story in the report is a lady came to the office recently and she said, Pam, I want to talk with you. I said, okay. We sat down and she said, I want you to know you've saved my life. I have lost 32 pounds by attending the Mediterranean program and changing the way I eat. 
Well, I didn't change. I didn't save her life, but she made changes that the MED program <coughs> suggested. This is curriculum-based research from NC State University. So I find that really exciting. Uh, the last part of my minute, I want to just say, how does it sound to you that uh, Family and Consumer Science has saved $386,060.58 for Cabarrus County? Steve, Commissioner Morris, Chairman, was at our Achievement Program where we celebrate the accomplishments of our Family and Consumer Science members, which are called ECA. We have a very large ECA program in Cabarrus County, and we're always so appreciative uh, when our chairman came to our recognition event and Commissioner Morris. But these hours, these 130, <coughs> excuse me, these 13,527 documented hours that these volunteers have shared promoting extension and family and consumer sciences realized a savings of $386,000 plus to Cabarrus County. And I regard my work with Family and Consumer Science and particularly the ECA program very uh, fulfilling and I value their volunteer hours. Thank you. So our staff is all very passionate about that and they all bring their, um, <coughs> their views from their uh, program areas, but across the board we are a volunteer ran organization. We um, use minimal county dollars, we have minimal state dollars that allows us to make huge impacts on the community with really only 10 staff members. Um, and so we have hundreds of volunteers that work with us um, for our outreach of thousands of people that we reach every year. Um, some good data in here really gives you a snapshot on who, um, on some of those little programs. This doesn't is not all encompassing. There's so many more programs that we do on top of all of these as well. Um, and then that doesn't even count the day-to-day -day things where somebody walks in with a spot on a leaf and says, what's wrong with my plant? Um, so, you know, we have all of those as well. Um, and we would be remiss if we didn't recognize the fact that we do that with two support professionals as well. So Christine Barrier is our administrative assistant um, who wanted to be on camera, didn't want to talk tonight. But <laughs> hello, Christine. Thank you very much for all that you do. Um, has a wealth of institutional knowledge, but also um, is the is our frontline person with dealing with all the random calls that we get and the other things. Um, extension is the uh, we are the phone number that people call when they just don't know who to call or what to do with whatever their thing is. And we pride ourselves on that, and we do continue uh, hope to continue to be that 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 group for all of our people in Cabarrus County for 2023. Um, our volunteer base is um, loud and proud and ready to roll for uh, 2023. And we look forward to all the great things that the future holds for us. So we'll open it up if you guys have any questions, comments, but um, thank you for your time. Thank you for that report. And you know, just like to say that uh, so so many different areas that, that, that you guys touch and, and it is a joy to to be at that ECA mm -hmm. breakfast every year and receive that big check for <laughs> all the money that you've saved folks. And I will say that uh, that your your comment about the enthusiasm of the the volunteers is, is not overstated. They are incredibly uh, enthusiastic and involved in them and the more you get to to talk with them the the broader the areas of activities that that that, that you understand that they're involved in uh, as well as uh, it's been a, a great privilege to to have been at some of your 4-H events as well and some of the competitions and award ceremonies and that kind of thing so I think the the average person in Cabarrus County is not aware of of, of the scope of, of services you guys offer. And I will say that I'm a proud graduate of the beekeeping course at yeah. the Extension <laughs> Service. And the list goes on, but you, you offer a lot and we certainly appreciate that. And I'll open up the floor for any other questions or comments. Yeah, well, uh, as Chairman Moore said, you know, thank you very much for what you guys do uh, for the county. and. I know I uh, participated in 4-H programs whenever I was a child, and I think they were great uh, courses. Um, and I encourage anyone to 
to get involved in that. Um, as you mentioned, my mother uh, took part in some of your cooking classes. My father is a beekeeper, um, and so I, I know you guys provide a very unique <clears throat> service uh, for our citizens. You know, with many different things, um, and as you said, you know, random things of you know somebody walking in the office asking you know, about an insect or a plant or, you know, something of that nature. Um, I did have one question. Um, you had mentioned about the farmer's market, and that was the second. The Could second you go? Saturday of each month. Okay. Um, we and take off <coughs> January and February, so they'll be back in March. Okay. And now where is that? Piedmont Which, Farmer's Piedmont. Market. Okay. At the Concord, the Winecoff location. Wine okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. I had missed that, so okay. I just wanted to, I'd like to come out and see that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the, the farmer's market itself operates every Saturday. Mm -hmm. It's just 4-H yes. presence. The wine cough yeah. location. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and also, um, Jessica is our, um, Jessica Klein is our support staff, uh, specialist. She is a half a part-time. Um, she's not able to join us tonight, but we have her to thank for this lovely um, put all the fun stuff together. She is our um, design, our content designer. Um, we bring the expertise and she makes it pretty. So um, we're super grateful to have her on board. Um, she is our most recent addition um, to the team and we um, are very proud to have her on board with us as well. Great. Okay. Well, and, and I failed to, to mention also some of the other things that, that you guys do to support us and and Tracy and other staff members were very involved in our Le Youth Leadership Institute that we kicked off last summer. Uh, they were also very involved in presentations for the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners annual conference that was held here in Cabarrus County. So uh, we lean on you guys a lot and you never let us down and we very much appreciate it. And we are happy to continue to serve in that role. Great, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we move now to item 3.2 from the county manager's office, the 2022 community survey. We're delighted to have Kasha Thompson with us to talk about that item. And she has guests as well. Hello, commissioners. Welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, we are here to discuss the community survey. Most of you are familiar with it. It takes place every two years. Oh, I think I've got a clicker coming my way. Uh, it takes place every two years. It gives, it gives the county a represent, representational understanding of resident opinions of county programs, services, resource allocation, and more. And so we've got Ryan Murray here with ETC Institute. They've done our survey <coughs> Uh, the last several times that we've done it, um, and they're known across the nation for their work. Uh, I wanted to add that the 2022 survey did something different. Uh, it included input on resident needs and strategic direction that we'll use to inform our strategic planning process. So Brian will get into that and talk about the survey and how it was administered. Yeah. Thanks, Kasha. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the last time we did this, it was around the same time frame two years ago but I was on the board, so I'm happy to be in the room today. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Otherwise, we'll just kind of get through the, the overview or the major findings, and I'll take any questions. Uh, so as Kasha already alluded to, ETC Institute's really known as the gold standard or the national leader for market research for government organizations. As you can see, there's a lot of blue kind of covering most, if not all, of your state there. We have a pretty good presence in the state, uh, and we've done surveys for a number of counties, but also a ton of municipalities all across the state here. The purpose of your survey is really an objective assessment. Uh, beyond that, we want to measure some trends. I'll talk a little bit more about trends in just a moment. But one of the main reasons that we do the survey is also to compare your performance to other communities, both nationally and regionally, and we'll see some of that as well today. Uh, beyond that, the intent of the survey is to help the organization that we're working with or help the county develop some priorities for improvement or priorities for investment. And we've done that through our priorities investment rating. We'll walk through that analysis, and it's really just kind of a, a guide as to what maybe is going to have the greatest impact on the largest number of homes in the community, something that you can kind of analyze, look into, dig into, and then kind of implement as a part of your strategic planning and decision making moving forward. Some survey design changes. Prior to the 2022 survey, you utilized a nine-point scale. Many years ago, that was kind of the standard. Uh, to more closely align you with our benchmarking to give you more accurate comparisons, 
we changed our scale to the five point scale in 2022, which really aligns you with most of the counties that we do surveys for in the state, uh, but also for our national comparisons as well. Many of the questions remain the same. We've updated and added a few, and we'll see some of those added questions at the very end related to education and communication. And the methodology uh, was actually the same as, as last time. It was the seventh survey uh, conducted for the county. It's a six-page survey, a little bit shorter than last year. I think last year was almost six and a half, seven pages. Uh, many new questions, many of the same questions to track those trends. Uh, it's administered by mail and online to a random sample of about 2,000 county residents. And the way that we do that is we purchase from one of the largest list brokerage firms in the world a list of all residential addresses based on the USPS master list in the county. We select at random 2,000 of those folks, and then we kind of harp on those 2,000 folks to make sure that they respond until we get to our goal of 400 completed surveys. We've done the survey for the county a number of times. We know how many surveys to mail, what type of follow-up efforts are needed, and we collected over our goal yet again and collected a total of 465 surveys, which gives us a margin of error of about 4.5%, 5%. It's, it's actually 4.5%, but I might allude to 5% at the 95% level of confidence. And what that means is if we were to go out and collect another 450, 465 surveys from 2,000 randomly selected residents in the county, we would get these same results, plus or minus that 4.5% margin of error for the questions where all residents uh, selected an answer for that question. So that's how the margin of error works on the results. The results are statistically representative when we look at demographics, but we also want to track those uh, through representation in the county geographically. So we map the home address of all respondents. As you can see, those dots are a little bit tough to see, a little bit more clear in the paper report. But as you can see, we had a good distribution of responses. I tracked this against the last couple of surveys, very similar distribution from previous surveys as well. <coughs> when we talk about overall perceptions of the county, over the last couple of years, I've been a little bit terrified uh, to present these slides to, to community leaders across the country. Uh, ever since lockdown and kind of coming out of lockdowns, we've seen community struggle, uh, sometimes struggling in those key areas, those key service items, specifically public safety services. Uh, really only two areas of the country have kind of not seen those same struggles in, in public safety services. North Carolina is one, and as you can see here, over 90% or roughly 90% satisfaction or very positive and positive ratings for all three or four of your, your public safety, sheriff's office, fire marshal, medical services, 911 call center at the top. This is really not the national trend that we've seen over the last two years that we've dealt with with the majority of my clients. Some of those items towards the bottom of this list are a little bit more underutilized. Cabarrus County Fair, not maybe underutilized, but a lot of neutral ratings. And so to interpret those, we really interpret that as a, as a passing grade. So kind of that C on, on the, the point scale there. So you made an impression on that person. It wasn't overly positive, but it wasn't necessarily negative either. So they didn't give you a positive rating, but they didn't give you a two or a one. And so we've grouped the twos and the ones together just to kind of give them space on the chart. Otherwise, in some of those public safety service items at the top, you wouldn't really be able to see the actual percentage of ones. But in our full report, the findings report actually has the tabular data that you can see all of those percentages spelled out there. We've got some GIS mapping that we've provided. I like to kind of introduce that in the presentation so you have some context for when you're looking at that. Uh, these, are, I believe, are divided into census block groups or zip codes, and I apologize that I... I've forgotten now, it's just escaped me. But the areas that are shaded are shaded based on the mean average in that rating. If we saw that dot map previously, all of those dots within each area are those ratings that are averaged and then shaded based on that same five point positive to very negative scale. As you can see, Cabarrus County's perception of the Sheriff's Office is really positive, very positive or positive throughout the entire county there. When we start to start to talk about some of the other items that influence perceptions, of the government or administration, we see a lot of neutral responses, approximately one third of our respondents kind of giving us those neutral responses. And that's actually a really honest answer for most folks. Uh, considering how many folks have a really good understanding of what's going on in county and municipal government, uh, these are actually some pretty decent ratings. Quality of county services offers to citizens is really that one that I'm looking at most. Uh, and about two thirds of your residents are satisfied with those particular items. We've also done some mapping for these questions. I, again, I just like to introduce these so we kind of have a feel for those when you get into the reporting itself and actually have those maps in front of you. Overall, most residents are pretty satisfied with the county and the providing of those services. Now, a couple of those neutral counties or areas, especially at the north there, uh, we didn't have a ton of surveys uh, from each of those areas, but those areas are less populated than some of those areas that are shaded satisfied or that four on that five point scale. 
when we talk about how you compare to the U.S. and North Carolina averages, we had originally provided some uh, averages that really just kind of went through the state. And as I mentioned, we've done a lot of work in the state, but you know, comparisons to municipalities that are fairly small or really small in some instances just isn't really an accurate comparison. So what we've done is developed a more <clears throat> accurate comparison of North Carolina averages. Now, while these, uh, there's not a, a large number of these counties, we did have Buncombe, Durham, Forsyth, and Mecklenburg all conducted a survey within the last two years. So we included their most recent ratings in all of these averages. So you're actually comparing yourself on that light blue line uh, to Forsyth, Buncombe, Durham, and Mecklenburg. So those are actually really good ratings. And as you can see, you're just really, really beating the national average in all aspects here. Uh, and performing really comparatively speaking uh, to those North Carolina county averages with the exception as a place to work, which is, you know, a lot of people likely driving into Charlotte or Mecklenburg County to work. So a lot of neutral ratings in that particular item. When we talk about influence of safety, this is that area that I wanted to show because we've had some concerns nationally with some of our clients when doing these surveys recently. But as you can see, you're stacking up very well against that North Carolina County average and actually outperforming the U.S. average in all of those other areas. As you can see down below, North Carolina County average was not available for crime prevention and some communities just kind of shy away from those particular questions. When we talk about impression of various programs and services, this is where I think the county really excels compared to the national average, but it also puts you right in line with your peers or those folks within the state that are also offering and asking the same questions on their surveys. You're doing very well and keeping in mind the margin of error on the survey is about four and a half percent. So when we kind of think about some of these percentages here, you could be actually well above or, or just right aligned with still all those North Carolina County averages, which is actually very good. Now we'll get into our priorities for improvement. This is again based on our importance or our priority investment ratings. And this is a little bit of a different of analysis than we've used in previous years where there's a qualifier question here. We asked respondents to indicate if they or anyone in their household had a need for each of the following services. These are kind of the, the major social services as well as other services that the county provides to residents. As you can see, high-speed broadband internet is kind of that one that most folks said uh, that they had a need for, or could use some assistance in. We then estimate the number of households for which respondents gave a yes response, just to kind of contextualize that. There's approximately 75,000 households in Cabarrus County, so over half indicated they had a need for high-speed or broadband internet. We then asked those respondents who indicated, yes, I have a need or my household has a need for those particular items, how well their needs are being met. Now, public transportation and bus services, we have not at all at 49%, but I'm going to backtrack a couple of slides here to show you that that item was not specifically one of the highest items that had a need. So only 14% of, of residents countywide indicated their household had a need for public transportation and bus services. So although it was the item that had the highest not at all needs met rating, it's really only predicated on 14% of the sample uh, in this particular situation. With some of those items at the top of this list that have the high, the fully partly met needs, really high concentration of those ratings at the top, those were the items that received the highest levels or some of the highest levels of the yes responses in the survey. What we do again is estimate again, based on that 75,000 households in the county, approximately how many households needs are not being met for the given service. And so we have services for those ages 50 and older. About 40% of the county's population is about 50 and over. So that makes a lot of sense. Recreational programs and facilities, another major contributing service that you all provide to the communities, cultural programs, those are some of the highest levels of unmet needs, but that's not enough. And in, in the past, we worked with Army installations and used this analysis for parks and recreation surveys. We determined it wasn't enough just to understand if you have a need and how well that needs being met. We need to also understand how important or how likely are you to actually utilize or actually uh, think that service is important to your household. So we added a follow-up question that based on the responses that you gave to the previous question, which goods and services should be the top priority from county leaders from June 2023 to June 2028? And so what we found is that housing and income was one of those top items along with employment in Cabarrus County, services for those ages 50 and over, high-speed internet and recreational programs and facilities. When we blend this analysis and in the full report in that section, you'll see the full methodology for this analysis, we kind of break these out into three tiers or three levels uh, of need. The items in the green are items that I always suggest to my clients that you're doing a pretty good job in. You're currently serving that level of need in the community. While we saw in one of the earlier slides there was relatively high levels of need for food assistance or job training, you're currently doing a really good job of assisting residents in those particular areas. We shouldn't cut 
uh, funding for those services. We shouldn't disinvest in those particular services, but continually or additional reinvestments in those services would kind of go for naught. The items in the blue are kind of those items in the middle. They're gonna reach a large number of homes, but not all those homes necessarily had that particular need. And the items in the red are our top priorities for improvement, mainly, namely because they'll have the largest impact on the largest number of households within the county. And so we prioritize these based on the number ratings that, the, that they're given, but my suggestion for this analysis and the interpretation of it is to take all of the top priority items and to kind of workshop most of those and determine which ones can you invest in feasibly and which ones are gonna give you the biggest bang for your buck, but understanding that it's based on the demographically representative data that suggests these items are gonna have the largest impact, again, on the largest number of households countywide. We've also done some mapping for these. This is a, a little bit of a difficult mapping situation, but we've done our best to kind of geographically display, display some of these results. This first is uh, the percentage of households that have a need uh, for, this one is housing that is no more 30% of your total annual income. We didn't have anybody in the definitely yes or the yes column. That's because those ratings were really distributed across the county pretty evenly. So the GIS maps are a little bit more difficult to track because of that. But we have a few areas, namely this area uh, that is orange, and this isn't displaying on the TV, but one of those items in the bottom, the southern portion of the county is gonna change to red in this slide. And this is the fulfillment of that need. So how well is that need being met by the county currently? And so we have that area that's definitely no down there. While there were more kind of um, generally no, there were a number of households that said they had a need for this particular service area in the previous question. And in this question, they said that that need's not being fulfilled very well. So this can kind of help us pinpoint areas of the county that maybe some of these social services or some of these other services might be pinpointed or geared towards specific geographic areas in the county. Same with some of the service ratings that we did as well. I also did this for recreational programs and facilities. We did have a few areas pop up blue which means it's higher levels if we have a need for recreational programs and facilities. And when we track that across the next map, those folks actually are having their needs met very well. So again, kind of the interpretation of these uh, is maybe a little bit more esoteric uh, than some of the straight ratings of the five point scales. Uh, but one thing about ETC is that when Kasha calls, I'm always gonna pick up, I'm always gonna return a voicemail or an email. So any interpretation or assistance with these types of maps, uh, ETC is always gonna be there to help you all kind of re-examine or redetermine what you're looking at here. Uh, so although a little bit uh, kind of on the, on the verge here, these are new for you all. We've not provided these before for the county, so we're, we're here for interpretation later on if, if need be. We also wanted to talk about communication and customer service. This was a really bright spot, I thought, in the survey results. We asked respondents if they were aware of the ways that residents can participate in local government. Uh, now we know about three quarters of our, our population understands they can attend or speak at public meetings, so hopefully the next public meeting is chock full of residents ready to, and eager to speak, uh, specifically participating in public hearings as well. We know that to be true, but we know that those folks don't always follow through with those particular actions. So when we look back at some of our other ratings in terms of how well you're informed or how transparent you believe the county government to be, I think that you should take that into context with the slide that folks know that they can come and participate in these meetings and that they maybe choose actively not to or, or just don't have the time currently. But we've got a lot of good numbers there. Now some of the items towards the bottom of this list are opportunities for improvements, direct contact with county leadership or commissioners. I know that is uh, you know, just one more thing to your all's list, but fewer than half of our respondents indicated that was something that they knew they could do to participate in local government. So definitely opportunities for improvement towards the bottom of this list. Some of the stuff we probably already knew towards the top. When we talk about level of agreement with statements about information received from Care Bears and County employees, we're really talking about customer service. Folks trust the accuracy of that information given by employees. The information provided improved the quality of life for them or somebody they know, about half or more of those folks agreed to that particular statement. And then the transparency statement is that one where I alluded to previously, well, I'm sure Cabarrus County is doing a really good job of being transparent. I'm guessing we'll be on YouTube or online at some point uh, in this meeting here, uh, but not all residents seem to grasp that transparency or how that should work or how that looks for them. So that's definitely another opportunity for improvement, just kind of letting folks know or pushing them in the right direction of understanding. We also had uh, about 78 or 80 percent of our residents indicate they're aware of the county's website, which is great, but still one-fifth of, of residents just didn't really know what the website URL likely was. We asked respondents and about half of them indicated that they'd contacted the county during the past year. And this is just phenomenal. 
If you look at the right, these are also customer service uh, ratings. This is respect and professionalism, accuracy of the information, how quickly they responded, how well their issue was handled, and how easy they were to contact. And as you can see, they're just an overwhelming swath of very satisfied and satisfied responses there, with very few, less than 15 or 16 percent there in the dissatisfied column. Now, one thing that's really difficult for county employees is that some folks are calling from the city of Concord about a city of Concord road that's maybe in disrepair. Now, what is a Cabarrus County employees supposed to do about that particular issue? Well, that's usually a redirection of that call. So unfortunately, staff here at the county are kind of in a tough position where they're redirecting folks just based on the nature of the call, which likely leaves that caller dissatisfied. So the fact that you had such high satisfaction ratings in all of these items and understanding half of our 465 residents or participants in the survey actually contacted you in the last year, whether by phone, self-service, or in person at an office, they had a really positive experience. And that's really tough to do for forward and facing uh, employees at the county or in municipal government as well. So those are just outstanding uh, results. I just had to make sure we, we harped on that just for a moment. Now, as I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, we had some new questions added for 2022. These were primar primarily related to education. Uh, we asked if anybody in their household attends Cabarrus County Schools, Kannapolis City Schools, or Rowan Cabarrus Community College. About 30% indicated yes. We asked if they feel that those schools are safe. A vast majority, given our margin of error, 85 or so more percent indicated those facilities are safe. They feel that those facilities are actually more adequate than they are safe, just to a certain degree. Just a few more folks there indicating the yes response to Q14C. And with that, I'll take any additional questions. There were just a few questions about the education. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that since it kind of makes up a larger portion of your, your county's budget. So. And Commissioner Packet should include all of the data we've received from ETC Institute. Uh, we'll put the information up on the county's website and, of course, send out a press release, make sure employees are aware of their great accomplishments. Um, and we also have uh, an online site where folks can go uh, and look up the data and adjust it to demographics and they can play around with it. So uh, the average Joe out there can go on the website and learn what they'd like to learn about the county. Oh, I have a, just a few questions. Yeah, please. What, is this like a, you said 2,000 people were sampled. Is that average for populations similar to ours? Yeah, so what we'd want to do is usually t kind of try for a 20% response rate. So we'll select about 20% of our goal. We'll extrapolate that out for about 2,000 households to be selected. Okay, and so the <laughs> ETC feels that that's an accurate depiction of yep. the county as a whole. Yep, yep, and that's really a function of two things. So it's accuracy, so the margin of error decreases as sample size increases. But as sample size increases, the cost of the service dramatically increases. Right. So for sending out a thousand survey, you know, to try to get a thousand surveys would, you know, maybe three or four times increase your cost of the project. So we can definitely always offer larger sample sizes, but 400 is an adequate sample size number uh, for 75,000 households in the community. Okay. For sure. And just what can we do to help get the responses back in? I mean, you had 465, to, to I believe it was. Yeah. How can yeah. we engage to, next time we do this to yeah, get yeah. people more responsive? I think that's a fine line um, <clears throat> where we work with Kasha and uh, we want to say, hey, you know, we want as many responses as possible always. Um, but we also don't want to necessarily um, impact or bias the sample. So, you know, in the future, we could talk about some additional press releases or maybe briefings or mm -hmm. on top of what you're probably already doing to push the survey results. Um, but I would say for 2,000 surveys, and keeping in mind, we've, we've been in business a long time, so we, we know how many surveys to send to get those 45 or 450 or so back. Um, so I think that just maybe some additional outreach could help. And maybe if the commissioners did that on social media, said, hey, in the next couple of weeks, you may receive a survey, you may be self-selected, or not self-selected, but randomly selected, that could maybe go uh, a distance in, in your ward or your district, if that's the way it works here, uh, to push responses. So as of late, we've had some better luck. But for a few years there, it was pretty abysmal response rates for most communities. But Cabarrus County has kind of consistently had that, you know, 400, 450 responses with without much trouble, I would say, yeah. without much pulling of teeth. We've had a lot of great success. Our residents are very quick to respond to the survey. Fast, yeah. I think um, uh, to answer your question, something that could help, the survey is six pages long, I think. Um, so anything you can do to make the survey shorter makes it easier on participants because it's a time investment. So I don't think it's necessarily the reach of the survey. 
it's really getting folks who are interested in providing that valuable yeah. detailed feedback yeah. uh, to the level that's going to be helpful for us so the survey instrument um, you know, we try to be very comprehensive because we only do this every so often, and this was a big year for us with the strategic plan. Uh, but you have an opportunity to do smaller surveys, and I think that that's the answer you're looking for there because we don't want to mess with that sample size. Um, so the survey went out through ETC Institute. Uh, it was not necessarily promoted by the county because not everybody got it. So there was not an opportunity to participate in the scientific version. Now we do have a link that we could make available after all the research is done, but you don't want to contaminate that research. So we have the opportunity to open these lines back up and ask the questions, but it would not be scientific. Uh, it would go to the voices that we hear in the room. Yeah. Um, and, and so this is a way to hear from the folks that never participate in government in the way that we engage with government. Yeah. So what's the timeline um, whenever you send out um, a survey, what's the response time that's given to an individual that receives this survey? Yeah, that's kind of up in the air. As Kasha mentioned, the respondents in Cabarrus County respond pretty quickly. Right. Um, usually, so is that like one week, one month? Usually about two weeks uh, is what we'll try to put in the cover letter. Is mm -hmm. if, if we need to put a time frame in the cover letter, I'll say within the next two weeks, please complete and return your survey. But follow-up attempts usually occur for about a total of four weeks. So you'll receive the survey, and that kind of initiates on our end some follow-ups, uh, either virtually uh, online or via postcard. Uh, and then if needed, we'll do some phone calling, which isn't particularly needed in Cabarrus County usually. Uh, but we usually leave the survey open for about four weeks, I would say. Yeah, and I think typical. 400 is the number that they target. So really, we exceeded our goals yes. for this. Uh, and so we're very proud of that. Yeah. And now, uh, what's the cost uh, to the county for this? It was right at 20000 okay. And so um, you said this is every two years? Yes. And there's been pauses when there were certain circumstances within the county. or um, So it, it hasn't been every two years yeah. throughout it's time, but yeah. we aim for that. Yeah. Okay. And that's usually our suggestion for folks is it's tough to act on these results after they've been collected within six months and then do another survey within that year so we usually suggest that every two years is kind of that good time frame for that excellent information I, th I think there were a lot of very revealing things in there and and I appreciate the opportunity to 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 study them further uh, certainly one that, that came to mind for me was, the, I think on several occasions, there were comments about um, that we could improve Cabarrus County as a place to work. And that goes hand, I recently uh, was involved in a conversation that was pointed out that we have 73,000 people that leave Cabarrus County every single day to go to work in another county. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that really gives us a message, the efforts that we're trying to recruit uh, industry and jobs into Cabarrus County is something that our citizens would appreciate if I interpreted your comments mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure that there are a lot of other and certainly compliments to county staff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there were tre tremendous results uh, in that, particularly in that last slide, kind of summarized it in people's satisfaction with the way they are, are, are treated by Cabarrus County employees, and, and that, that makes us all proud all the time. And uh, it, it's nice to see those results coming back from our citizens. Yeah. So thank, thank you for your work. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioners. Okay, we move now to emergency, emergency Medical Services Headquarters Project Update. We're happy to have Kyle Billifer with us for that item. Uh, good evening. Uh, spent a lot less time up here than the last one. All I have is a brick and some glass to show you all. Um, could you go to the pictures? Um, so the milestones over the last 30 days were uh, getting everything ready to be as basically to be able to start taking the panels for the building. Um, they were supposed to ship after Christmas. I'm still optimistic that they'll be here in the next week. Um, but what you've seen over the last 30 days is all the brickwork going in. So you're seeing the two different colors of the brickwork. Can you scroll down to the next picture? 
So that kind of shows you kind of the breakup, the aesthetic breakup um, that was originally shown in the renderings of the building. So um, the rest of what's going in is all the storefront glass throughout the building. Go through one more. And we've already started to button up what's inside. So you're seeing all the draw drywall and all the MEP going in. Um, about 50 to 60% of our equipment is in already. Um, we're still waiting for, for a couple other pieces. Um, and like I said, it'll really start to take place probably over the next two months when you see the, start to see the Parklex panels go in. Um, it'll start to actually look like a building. I think they're uh, the longest lead time, which that's the type of, it looks like the wooden panel that we have directly behind me on the courthouse. It, it, it is the same panel. It is not the same color, but it is the same panel. But um, the, for some reason, when we ordered them for the courthouse, they were the first thing that came, but for this building, they're the last thing that will be coming. So that kind of gives you an update, and we're still trending for, for May and June of 2023. So no change in that. And I'll take any questions that you all have about the pictures or anything else. No questions. Good report. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Okay, we move now to discussion items for action. First up from Sheriff's Office, uh, we're happy to have Chief Deputy Bailey and Tessa also with us. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, kind of sad news, but yet positive news at the same time. We have a working canine, a uh, six-year-old Bel Belgian Malinois. If you've read um, some of the uh, accompanying documents in, in your packets, um, developed a chondrosarcoma on the rib cage. <clears throat> the handler noticed that the dog wasn't quite as, what's the word to look for, as responsive. agile, responsive. Um, we did spend some county dollars to diagnose the problem. Uh, through our canine budgeted funds, we found that the sarcoma is going to require part of the rib cage to be removed and a steel or wire mesh in its place to remove the tumor. Uh, in speaking with the specialist, we find that the cost is prohibitive to keep the dog on the line. Um, we did not want to do a transfer without seeking funding privately to, to have this surgery done, so we did find private funds, donors who are going to donate the funds to have this uh, operation done, but it is gonna take the dog out of service. And then it's customary for uh, handlers who want the, the, the canine when it's um, uh, retired to, to, to get the canine. We do have the accompanying paperwork. I hope, hopefully, uh, the clerk has got that in your packet as well. He is a, a going to assume responsibility for the canine and the care of the canine. And again, we do have private funding uh, that's gonna take care of the cost of the, uh, the animal's uh, surgical needs. Um, Finding out between the time the agenda item was put on and speaking with the captain who oversees that unit, uh, we are asking that we suspend the rules today and go ahead and have that surgery done as quickly as possible. So I'm asking that we can suspend the rules today and go ahead and vote to transfer ownership over to the handler. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Chief Deputy? Well, certainly uh, that. Bad news to, to hear of this, but I'm glad that there is a solution and certainly uh, yeah. compliments and appreciation to those individuals that stepped up to help with the, the funding. Yes, the, the, uh, the captain and the canine team both have contacts out in the community um, and they reached out to those contacts and again, um, got private donors. And again, it's, it was just cost prohibitive one uh, to do it and, and, and to the dog, I just don't think, I, I don't trust having it out functioning in, in its capacity. It's a, it is a full patrol dog and a, an explosive detection dog. So it is utilized quite frequently. And the first time you'd have a suspect or somebody that would kick the dog or something, we, we feel like it would be detrimental to the, to the dog. So we, we do have all this worked out and hopefully we'll have ownership transferred over today. Right. I got a question. Um, yes. How many canine dogs do we have in Cabarrus County? Seven. In service, okay. At the Sheriff's Office, seven. And, and sheriff, we're kind of unique, uh, Commissioner Meese, in the fact that we also have the uh, regional bomb team. Mm -hmm. So it's a little higher number than most agencies our size because we have some exclusive um, explosive detection dogs as well. Uh, yeah, one assigned to the courthouse permanently. And that's a smaller kind of Colombian lab. That's not a pointy eared dog that. Uh, uh, that we utilize over there. But yeah, we've got um, seven right now. Okay. And of course, this is going to take one out of the mix. Right. Um, okay. But um, but we're looking to, through the budget process, to try to budget a replacement for that dog as well. And now, how many years of service 
Are they usually? I know it varies <laughs> yeah. depending on dogs, but what's Typically customary? Typically eight to ten years. Okay, so that's Typically. longer than I thought it would be. Yeah, uh, uh, it, you it, might retire them a little early. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, we love they. They would probably they enjoy working, believe yeah. it or not, and uh, so so most of the time when we take them out of service, they're actually. Uh, I hear that they're they're quite depressed for a while. They like to get out and work, and they're riding with their handlers. Uh, so, but about eight to ten years, depending. Now, the the uh, smaller dogs that are in the courthouse, they may have a little bit longer tenure. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet. This is the first time we've utilized, um, you know, uh, other than Malinois or, or German Shepherds. So we're kind of waiting to see what the life uh, the tenure is of that dog's service. But yeah, we've got seven and. And uh, they're all out doing doing their thing. Just to add to that, obviously, um, this past year showed the need in our schools um, with the explosive right. detection dogs, um, and they were mm -hmm. used readily. Obviously, to be, unfortunately, that is an attempt to disrupt education, and we can get the dogs out there quicker than a full deployment of our bomb squads. So yeah, they we get were out able there to clear, clear schools. schools in an hour, uh, which wow. normally would take a day. Uh, because of these dogs and they're they're very good at what they do uh, and unfortunately again this was a dual purpose dog with uh, full patrol and uh, and explosive detection but you know again we just feel like the risk is is outweighing um, any any of the any of the uh, yeah. service they could provide and I don't want to endanger the dog uh, in any way shape or form so that's the ask and well, we appreciate their service oh, absolutely. and we appreciate what you guys do thank, thank you, you very you much for keeping us safe that. Any other questions? Well, commissioners, I would at this time entertain a motion to suspend the rules to take action on this item. I'll make that motion. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And at this time, I would entertain a motion to declare K-9-0. Zeno. Z Z Zeno. My, it may have been my, my typing too. I, I don't no, know. no, no. I probably need to put my glasses on. Uh, surplus property and authorized disposition in accordance with the county's policy. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. That motion Thank passes. Thank you. Thank and you, commissioners. Best, best of luck. Uh, I hope that there is a good outcome. I do as well, and what I will do, just just for informational purposes, I'll send an update to Lauren, and she can get it out to you guys Excellent. as far as the, uh, the outcome of the surgery. We will appreciate Thank that. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next we move to item 4.2 from Active Living and Parks, Carolina Thread Trail Resolution of Support. Uh, Londa Strong and, and her support team as well. That's right. <clears throat> This is Mark Kincaid from the uh, Carolina Thread Trail. Oh, sorry. Um, Carolina Thread Trail approached us last month sometime with this opportunity for uh, a grant through uh, North Carolina DOT. And Mark let me know about it and said, here's what's going on. All of the, I think all the municipalities are on board. And so we wanted to bring this to you all, and Mark is going to explain it. Is it? I have to apologize. My my phone carries message after message after message, and Lauren and I were back and forth with, "Do you have that map? It's not on mine." <laughs> so please go right ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and commissioners. Before I begin, I would like to answer a question that Londa asked the last time I was here with you. Uh, she asked me, how many miles of Carolina Thread Trail do we have in Cabarrus County? And I didn't know the answer then, but I do tonight. And that is 30 miles, 30 miles of Greenway and Blue Way in Cabarrus County, which is very exciting. Uh, as Londa said, in November, uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation announced a new grant, and that is entitled uh, Paved Trails and Sidewalk Feasibility Study Grant Program. Uh, feasibility study is not a full-blown design. It, it's a more basic look at the strengths and weaknesses of various trail corridors. And so the Carolina Thread Trail has put together a partnership consisting of the city of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, Cabarrus County, 
town of Harrisburg and city of Concord with the thread trail in the lead to apply for a grant. Uh, we're not sure the exact dollar amount at this point. We're still working on that, but it'll be somewhere in the range of 100 to $120,000. Uh, no, there is no requirement for a match uh, for this grant. Uh, the, the map that you see, um, let me just say it in words, and I don't want to get bogged down by the, the map itself, but what we will do is we will look at the last 500 yards of Mallard Creek within the city of Charlotte about two miles of Mallard Creek as it heads eastward to into uh, town of Harrisburg where it merges with Rocky River and then upstream along Rocky River past the speedway under Highway 29 past the drag strip and the golf course uh, and connecting to the existing Hector Henry Greenway uh, of City of Concord. That study area if you include the alternative alignments that we will consider uh, is about 10 miles in length. Uh, we will look at uh, potential stream crossings. There could be seven or eight. Uh, we will uh, look at an alternative way of getting around the speedway by uh, creating a multi-use path up Moorhead Road up to Highway 29 and then back down to the bridge. And so at the end, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for public input uh, during this process. Um, at the end, we'll have a, a document. There's no obligation to continue with design and construction, it, but it, it is, uh, will provide all of the partners with uh, some framework to consider uh, should they decide to pursue design and, and development. And, there, and that will include a cost estimate as well uh, to begin with. And so. I, I believe the deadline is the 9th. The deadline is next Monday. January the 9th, but uh, DOT told Carolina Thread Trail that because of the short deadline, that as long as they had, like, that it's coming here. A draft, res a, a draft resolution, resolution. And an anticipated date of passing that that would suffice. So that's why we were asking for the resolution. We didn't ask for it to be waived. We would next at the regular meeting to be approved if it is uh, just a resolution of support. And I believe David finalized one. Yes. Okay. And so if you have questions, I Questions, commissioners. I, I like I like the sound of that part. Um, 120,000 funding with no match required. <clears throat> it sounds like it will definitely be beneficial to several of our municipalities as well as the county itself. So, I certainly would be very supportive of it. So now, Thank you. after um, after this is completed, what what are the next steps on this? Um, that would be up to each municipality or county agency uh, to act or, or not act, but the next step would be design of a given segment uh, within each uh, jurisdiction and, okay. and um, also uh, site acquisition. Commissioner Meesmer, uh, it has been the county's plan from the beginning, however many years ago that was, 10, or 10 years ago, when the thread trail was originally um, manned and developed for Cabarrus County, is that we we would connect the municipalities, the all of the cities and towns would build theirs, and then our responsibility would be connecting. Like as an example, between Kannapolis and Concord, there's a, how, how many? 500 yards. 500 yards, that's in the county. And so that would be, and we've tried to connect that for several years, but have not been able to yet. But that's that's our plan. That's the county's plan from from beginning. So, yeah. Well, I think I was here whenever maybe Probably. that was <laughs> it's been the while. first time. Yes. Yeah. Whenever um, that came about. So, um, okay. I'm just curious what the next steps will be. Yes, sir. So of of this area that's being studied now, what? Um, what percentage of that would not be in a municipality? 
that would fall under the county's responsibility. Do you have an estimate of that? It looks like most of it is in a municipality. Um, of that 2.1 miles from the county line to the confluence with uh, Rocky River, I think one point, I think one mile was unincorporated okay. and, and the remainder was uh, town of Harrisburg. Yeah. yeah. So just about 50% in this, this situation. Yes, sir. Yeah. So now what happens if say Cabarrus County did not want to participate once this goes through, you know, plans there, Cabarrus County doesn't want to participate, but town of Harrisburg does. Does that leave the gap? That leaves a gap in the thread, thread trail? Is that correct? Or? Participate in the feasibility study? No, no, no. After the feasibility study is done, then. Development. Yeah, de yeah. yeah. Well, after this part, yeah. Is yeah. Done. It may, or the development process may present an opportunity, or future grants uh, may become available that, uh, that w uh, would help the thread trail or, and perhaps the county uh, feel like it was affordable to develop. So there's, there's uh, options out there, okay. unforeseen. But, I mean, there could be a situation where there's a gap for a while. If, if yes, yeah, certainly well. this is a, a legacy project. It's gonna take decades to, mm -hmm. to complete. But uh, what you're looking at on the map, if we were to pan out is uh, what we consider the, uh, the main north-south spine of the Carolina Thread Trail. That yellow line, if it were to continue, well, it connects to what's called the Cross Charlotte Trail, which is, a, I think, a 31-mile master-planned trail. By the time it hits the Lancaster County line, it's, um, there's a master plan all the way down to Great Falls, South Carolina. So that's you're looking at part of a 140 mile corridor uh, that is our biggest priority. So we'll find a way. Uh, may take a while. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think Londa remains with us to talk about Farm Mill Road Park. You may have been here when we opened Farm Mill. I think that when you, after you said that, I was like, you know, that was about the same time. <coughs> I believe you were. Um, just a little bit of uh, background on, on this. Out at Farm Mill Road Park, and the town of Harrisburg operates that now, maintains it, operates it. It is leased to them. In 2007, we opened the park to the public, the Cabarrus County. And then in 2010, the town of Harrisburg came to us and wanted to annex that into their city limits um, for various reasons. The county agreed to it. I believe Mr. Cook is the one that drew up the agreement at the time. Um, and we have an agreement with them. They have approached us a couple of times in reference to us deeding the park to them. We have a land and water conservation fund grant as well as a park and recreation trust fund grant that was used to develop that um, park. And so the first time they came, I asked the grant administra administrator for the state. He said, yes, it can be done, but if you do this, it will reflect poorly on Cabarrus County and you'll have a really hard time of acquiring another grant. That's operate, that's administered through the state. So we're like, okay, we'll hold off. We won't, we won't do that. You all can continue to operate it, man it, maintain it everything that's taken care of. And then that particular administrator retired uh, when we were looking at uh, WW Flow Park with the Park and Recreation Trust Fund grant to go into the city, brought it up again, and he was like, oh, no, that's, you can do this. You can transfer. So they have approached us again about that, and this is just to see if you all are interested in us pursuing this or not of transferring deeding it to Harrisburg 
So that's that's what this is about today. Questions? Uh, what is the lease payment on the park I think, for the benefit of the public? It's a one dollar. Well, that's what I thought. Yeah. One dollar. Yeah. So it's not a financial issue. No, no, yeah. no, not at all. Well, I'm in favor of allowing the county to deed this to the town of Harrisburg. Um, so whenever you say maintenance and upkeep, I mean that they have they do pay everything. For everything. Okay. Is there any county staff or resources that go into it at all? No. Nothing. Okay. No, not at all. Okay. And now the town of Harrisburg limits. I, I don't have a map of that, but I'm assuming it's got to be right all in that region. Oh yeah. They, right. Yeah. yeah. I'm okay. not sure if it's totally in. They took it all took, in. Took they, around the entire park. And. Uh, and Canterfield, yeah. yeah, that's okay. Yeah. They did all of that at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm in favor of transferring ownership to down of Harrisburg. Okay. I agree. I think it's a good good practice if we can develop benefits for citizens and and the municipal municipalities are willing to uh, cooperate with us and operate them. That that's that it benefits everybody. Oh, yeah, and you've heard me say before, I know Byron has many times, people, the residents don't care who owns and operates anything as long as they have what they need. Right. And a lot of them don't even know that it's the county or Concord or whoever that operates. Just like in that, um, with the survey, the phone calls that we get in reference to the city of Concord, you probably get more than we do, and I'm sure it's vice versa. Okay, any other questions or comments? Anything to add? I really think that is it. I think the Commissioner Morris's statement is, is really they, they have to seek approval from us. It would be the really the only uh, factor in that of, of development or any changes to the property. So this would give that right to them to, to make those moves when needed. I think a good comparative situation is the one that we had with Frank Lisk Park when we were leasing the property for a dollar from the state of North Carolina. And we were very happy uh, to be relieved of that responsibility of having to gain approval every time we had a project and that sort of thing. So I certainly understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We will be back to you with letters that have to go to the state and all that for these grants. Right. Perfect, thank you. Okay. The next item, 4.4, .4, appointments to boards and committees, and all of you have a copy of those uh, in your agenda as well as you should have received an email. Uh, does anybody have any questions or concerns about any of those? Uh, if not, we will move to item 4.5 from Cooperative Extension. We're glad to have Tracy LeCompte back with a budget amendment. Thanks. Now I come back with the fun stuff. Um, so uh, you'll see this budget amendment in your packet. And um, each year we do special programming um, options, opportunities through Cooperative Extension. Um, we have historically had an event that has been hosted by our Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association. Um, they um, post COVID have restructured and, and are not able to um, man the or take on the responsibilities of the um, the money in and out and the vendor and that kind of stuff. So we as Cooperative Extension have taken that um, program under our supervision and working with that. So it is the um, Extension Spring Plant and Herb Festival that happens. Um, that happened regularly historically um, during in, during April at the Cabarrus Arena and Event Center. Um, so we are excited about bringing that back this year. Um, it will be held on April 29th um, at the arena, and um, we're currently accepting vendors. Um, and the vendor fee for that um, program is fifty dollars, and that's why we're here because um, originally in the budget we had not budgeted to allow. A, um, the amount in both the income and expense 
uh, line items for that. So as our vendor fees are coming in and the things that are coming in for that, um, that line, those two line items need to be increased um, to accommodate that. Um, we do historically have between 60 and 100 vendors. So obviously that's a good chunk of change to help put on that thing. We are taking that responsibility um, of putting on that event um, with all of the uh, promotional marketing and all of that as well and any of the vendor expenses and the site expenses that um, will happen that day. So um, the two line items that are associated with this are um, our program, our 9356 program uh, line items, and um, a 6606, the uh, revenue line item. And so we're just increasing both of those by $3,000 to allow for that allotment, that future income, because we're not right there yet, but we will be, um, I think we, in that line item, we only have room for like five more dollars. So <laughs> I need to increase that to allow for um, the, that vendor payment that's going to be coming in in the next couple months. Questions for Tracy? Well, it's exciting, uh, I think, as we look at the uh, weather a week ago today and then the temperature <laughs> today and then thinking about our herb festival. It's all making me feel excited about spring already. Now <laughs> is the yeah. perfect time to be planning your garden indoors. Don't do anything until after, after April 15th, but um, now is a great time to be thinking and planning and dreaming. Seed catalogs are in the mail and all those beautiful things. So yeah. yes, we're happy to be involved in all the aspects of our spring gardening and excitement. Great, thank Thanks. you. Okay, we move now to item 4.6. Um, behavioral Health Center design recommendation and Rodney will lead us in that discussion along with our friends from the human experience. Uh, we'll get us started. Um, as you know, we were fortunate to receive, uh, based on the work of our local de delegation, a $32.5 million state grant uh, to design and construct a behavioral health facility off of Kannapolis Parkway. Back in September, uh, the board approved hiring Human Experience as our design firm for that effort, and in particular, Sherry's expertise from a clinician perspective uh, was uh, valuable in the work that we saw coming. Um, we have analyzed two different models. One is what we're calling the Guilford model, which is two separate facilities uh, owned by two separate owners with two separate providers, and the model that we are recommending here today, which is a single facility, and we'll talk through the reason for those recommendations. So I'm going to let Kevin and uh, Sherry introduce themselves to you uh, and tell you a little bit about their background, and then I'll jump right in. Thanks, Rodney. Um, so we are human experience. Uh, Sherry and I are the owners of this company, and um, we are honored to be working with you as your designers. We are, we are not an architecture firm with experience in behavioral health care. We are a behavioral health care firm with experience in architecture. So this is our primary focus, it's our area of expertise, and um, so this specialty project, we brought, brought that to it. Uh, so I am an architect who spent most of my career doing that, and Sherry is a clinician. I'm Sherry Reyes. Um, my background is actually clinical psychology, and then I went on to run freestanding uh, behavioral health hospitals as CEO. So I am familiar with the full continuum of care from inpatient all through outpatient. So I look at things from the clinical and financial aspects so that through the design process, we understand um, every single decision as it relates to clinical and financial implications. So the recommendation that you'll hear tonight is coming from their input uh, in addition to county leadership, um, who we are not clinicians, we are not subject matter experts. So we have leveraged uh, Sherry's expertise, Marcella Beam, who's in the room. I see some Health Alliance folks who are definitely subject matter experts. Um, so we have a good uh, showing here that can speak to some of the complexities of this effort. So at the outset, we wanted to just level set with some terminology, just because we're going to throw a lot of alphabet soup at you, and we want to make sure that you understand what the terms are. And so I'm not going to read all of these to you, but there are some basic concepts that are going to come up. So behavioral health urgent care, uh, facility-based crisis, psychiatric residential treatment facilities, uh, substance use disorder, and then the last one I will touch on, which is the IMD exclusion. Uh, this is the, <laughs> the federal rule that prohibits us from getting Medicaid reimbursement if we have more than 16 beds in a facility. That is the reason that Guilford County structured their facilities in such a way that they did. 
Uh, and so what we're recommending today is a way to work around that because that's the current rules that are in place. So just some data uh, to, to speak to the challenge, and this is just specific to our emergency department. And you can see here the, the staggering numbers um, just in 2021 alone. Uh, so nearly 1,000 residents going for suicidal ideation, nearly 3,500 for depression, and over 4,600 for anxiety. Um, these are emergency department admissions. And so to respond to that challenge is the reason that we were able to uh, get this funding from the state to, again, design and construct this facility off of Cannapolis Parkway. So this facility will be built on the acreage that we own in front of the Milestone Building. Um, so I know you all are, are all familiar with that. So we have about seven acres that we own uh, that this facility can be constructed on. And so those parcels are shown there. From a funding perspective, we have the $32.5 million state grant. We also have an additional $3 million roughly that we had set aside in previous fiscal years. So you're looking at a total project budget of about $35.5 million. Our goal going into this project is for human experience to work with the state grant money only. Uh, so they're gonna work toward a project that will come in at $32.5 million or less. If that is possible, that $3 million can then be reallocated to other capital needs, whether that's school educational needs or whether that's another county project. Um, if it becomes necessary, then obviously that can go towards this project. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was very abrupt. <laughs> I won't do that again. So this is the Guilford model. Uh, so two buildings. So you can see on the left, uh, the behavioral health urgent care and the adult facility-based crisis. Uh, they have 16 chairs for the BHUC, and they have 16 beds for the adult FBC. And then on the right, you can see the separate uh, facility that is child and adolescent based, 16 beds. That is owned by their LME MCO, and it is operated by Alexander Youth Network. The county owns the BHUC and adult FBC, and they have contracted with Cone Health, their local health care provider, to operate that facility. Down at the bottom, you can see for Guilford County going with this particular model, they are spending about five and a half million dollars annually from their operating budget to support it. Um, we did an RFP several months ago and we received two provider proposals to operate this type of facility. And it ranged from zero dollars or close to zero dollars all the way up to eight million dollars of local money uh, that would be needed. And so it was quite the wide range uh, to operate this exact facility. So over the last three months, we've evaluated that and we've looked at the, what we see as inefficiencies and, and the lack of flexibility in that model. And so what we are recommending to you tonight is a single facility, single owner, hopefully single provider model. And this shows you sort of the continuum of care that is being recommended. Um, and so you start with, for our under 21 population, um, we have worked with partners to identify a need for psychiatric residential treatment beds. And so we would add those beds rather than the child and adolescent facility-based crisis beds. Uh, we would have substance use disorder beds, which are uh, under the current 1115 waiver, uh, so we can still get Medicaid reimbursement for those. The behavioral health urgent care uh, chairs, and then also facility-based crisis beds specifically for adults. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but in this structure, those beds would not be reimbursable from Medicaid. Uh, but we think that is a trade-off worth, worth making. And then also wrapping in outpatient services, uh, budget permitting. So this slide speaks to the benefits, and I'll let Sherry weigh in here um, as she sees fit, but the biggest piece of operating a single facility and the biggest benefit <coughs> is in the administrative efficiency. Um, so if we have two separate facilities, we have to have two separate medical directors, security, cleaning, custodial, um, food services, and then staffing can't be shared between the two facilities. And so we think that inefficiency uh, is problematic, especially when we know that the state has the intention of seeking a waiver um, for the 16 bed limit. Uh, and so we think a single facility is gonna be best long-term and short-term. The other issue is 
the 16 bed limit keeps us within 32 beds here locally when we know the need is so great. And so this facility will be able to add additional capacity into the 40 or 50 bed um, threshold that will better meet the community needs. And then the last thing I would say is it is a opportunity to leverage higher reimbursement services to offset the loss in revenue. And so we know that PRTF beds and that substance use disorder beds can be reimbursed at a higher rate. And that should help us along with the staffing efficiencies and administrative efficiencies to offset the lost revenue uh, for a period of time. Anything you want to add? Yeah, and I, I think the other thing to point out is it's not only the lost revenue just of the adult FBC beds, but it's actually provides an opportunity to have net less vulnerability from the county standpoint in terms of annual um, support. So the staffing um, efficiencies are, are important um, financially, but given the staffing shortages, you, you don't want to artificially inflate the staffing requirements as well. And then there's also a lot of clinical um, indications for having kind of a one-stop shop where every all the services are under one roof, staff can support other staff, um, there's no wrong door for any, for any patient of any age or population um, needs. And then there also we're talking about a continuum of care, so it's not just an FBC in one building and an FBC in another, and a BHUC, you know, with the one, but it's actually lower levels of care as well to support the the longer term needs um, as a step up, and you know, to, to prevent crisis or a step down from crisis. And if you don't mind, just yeah. elaborate a little bit on the the sort of flexibility and the design approach. So from an architectural standpoint, and Kevin can certainly chime in on this too. Uh, we're trying to design. Um, the options so that all of the units or subunits can long term be a lot of different things. So right now what we're proposing in terms of, if you want to go back a slide, uh, what we're proposing in terms of the adult FBC, the uh, psychiatric, psychiatric residential treatment beds for 21 and under, the adult substance use disorder beds, those are the PRTF and the substance use disorder beds, those are allowable Medicaid reimbursement under current rules today. However, this is a constantly evolving um, topic in terms of the state as well as um, kind of nationally. So that we're trying to design it so that if we wanted to have different services in those same units long term, it could morph with the county's needs um, as as time goes. There are different levels of regulatory requirements for each of these different licensure types. And what we have proposed is to design all of them to the highest level of regulatory standards so that any of these units can in the future be something different. You may find that the needs of the county change over time. You may find that providers come in and provide services that change what the county wants to provide to supplement that to make sure that all of the residents of the county are getting what they need. So the goal is to design this so that this can adapt and change over time in the most efficient way possible, whatever the rules are, because they change frequently. And I think the, with that, for you all, the, the goal here is to get your support of the single building approach. Um, the specific types of beds, this is what we believe today makes the most sense, but that could change uh, six months from now or, or five years from now. Um, so it's really just the, is the single building approach something that the board supports? And then the last slide is um, just talking about the selection of a provider. So if you approve proceeding down this path, uh, we will reissue the request for proposals that we did previously that had two uh, providers submit, and it would be based on this new scope of work and we will see what the market shows and as far as whether it's still those same two providers or if we get additional providers. And our hope would be to make a selection by June. Um, our goals are twofold. One is we wanna make sure that it is quality care that is being provided in the facility. And the second is to minimize our local impact from a financial perspective. And so those are the two goals we will communicate through that RFP. Um, and we will see what that, how that shakes out, and then obviously we'll bring that back to the board uh, when we go to make a selection. 
So that is the presentation. Uh, we have folks in the room much smarter than me that can answer any technical questions, um, but we'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have questions or comments? I will say that um, I'm in favor of the one building owner operator approach. Uh, you know, the meeting that we had earlier this afternoon um, discussing the different options, I think that makes the most sense uh, for Cabarrus County to move forward in that direction. Um, I would like to see um, the number at 32.5 and keep it there instead of us having to dip into, you know, um, the county funds um, separately. So I, I feel like that would be crucial to stay uh, within that budget, in my opinion. Um, and I believe I just want to say I support the, the single building option. Good. So. I'd like to say I support that as well. I think mental health and in our meeting, mental health is a massive area that's not going away. I think this option with the one building allows us to, to hit it pretty good in one shot. Um, you said that the nurses would be able to hopefully move around and help each other, which would also help with staffing. I do agree with uh, Commissioner Meesmer. It would be very nice if we could hit that 32.5 million, um, and that way we can put ours towards something else that we, we need. Um, but I appreciate it, and I am also in favor of that one building. I'm sorry, I have one more uh, question. Uh, I know earlier you had mentioned that you guys um, do facilities, I guess, all across the, the country. Is there any here close by that you guys have been involved in? Um, sure. You know, just, just out of curiosity. Uh, or anything that's equivalent to this size. I know you may you sure. know, work with all different sizes or what. Sure. M most, recently, uh, most recently, we worked with, with Duke Health on their, their new expansion for Behavioral Health Pavilion, which has uh, 42 beds, so that's pretty equivalent to what we're doing. It also has outpatient ECT, so it's a little bit different range, and it has a, it's connected to their ED, so it's similar to the Behavioral Health Urgent Care we're proposing. Um, prior to forming Human Experience, um, I led the design of Monarch's uh, FBC down in Charlotte, um, as well as the Hopeway Center, which is a regional healthcare uh, facility in Charlotte that provides a uh, higher level of care outpatient services. So those are all pretty, pretty comparable to this one. Okay. How about the Guilford model? Were you guys involved we in that? We were not involved in that. Okay. And uh, budget wise on some of those other projects, was it, what, what was the cost on some of those other projects, would you say? Uh, uh, let's see. So the ones that are similar in scope to this. Yeah. Um, I don't want to misquote a number. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't have that at my fingertips, okay. so I'd have to look it up to make sure I don't say okay. it wrong. All right. Thank you. I echo both commissioners on. I, I agree with that, and I'd like to stay within the 32 uh, million. I do have just a clarifying question because I wasn't able to meet with you because of a work issue. Um, when we're talking about the what is covered by insurance and what is not covered by the insurance, how do we? take care of that are they you know are those patients for billing purposes in a totally separate area so that there's no conflict and then when you're sharing nurses because one's not getting reimbursed and one is how does that work so um to to be to clarify we're our intent from a design perspective is to keep the children and adolescent completely separate from the adults because i think that is absolutely imperative um, we all agree on that, I think. Um, but in terms of level of care, it's the, the important part is that the patient gets into the appropriate level of care at the right time, and funding source is usually not part of that equation. So related to the BHUC and the FBC, it wouldn't be necessarily part of the equation. Depending on how you operationalize it, it could be part of the equation for the, the PRTF because that, that would be considered an elective service, but that's how you want to run it. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility there. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Rodney, I got a question for you. If if we get into this and the number is going above 32.5, are you, you, do you have to come back to us to, to, um, to get approval for additional or that's already been set aside and budgeted? It so. has already been approved. Okay. Because I, like I said, I, I would like to stay firm on that. And, you know, if there's a situation, I'd like to be aware if we're having to spend some of our own funds 
for that. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, yeah, I would just uh, certainly applaud the, the, the work that you have done in coming up with this design. I am, uh, I, my, I don't want to sound exaggerated, but over the moon with this, with this proposal. We've talked about it. Uh, so much and and so my compliments to you and to staff and and I, I, I see our folks from the Cabarrus Health Alliance here they have participated from the beginning uh, in the visits that that we've had with the the Guilford facility and to to think about the the, the entire history um, of this project we started these discussions and I don't know exactly how many years ago but it's been quite a few and we had zero funding uh, at that time. We also had an LME MCO that, that we were displeased with that we did not think would participate in this project as we had seen in other places. Uh, since that time, uh, we've, we've managed to, to, to improve that situation uh, and, and, and our uh, relationship with partners has been good so far. Uh, that, as was mentioned earlier, they're on board with this project. Uh, we had zero funding uh, at that time. So, I mean, hats off to our local delegation to the General Assembly. Uh, they were willing to sit down with us and, and, and hear our plans and hear our proposals and help us with that funding, uh, the acquisition of the, of the property. Uh, which I'm very excited about what that offers as well. We'll be at the Milestone facility where, where partners will have their offices. Our human services department will have their, uh, some of their services there as well. Along with this facility, there will be a lot of synergies, I think, that will exist there. Um, you know, the, the, the financial model that, that you guys have talked about, I think, is excellent. As, as was mentioned in the um, earlier discussions, um, the, the ultimate goal in what we're trying to do is we're trying to make people's lives better. And we're trying to address a problem, but we can also make a financial argument for it as well. Uh, and that is with, with and, and we, you know, you pointed some of those things out, some of the savings that we realize from our our, our sheriff's office, our law enforcement agencies, our emergency, our EMS services, the transportation. I mean, there are uh, significant savings that will be realized by Cabarrus County taxpayers by the services that we provide here. And it's, it's, it is, I don't think there's probably any family in Cabarrus County <clears throat> that has not been touched by a behavioral health issue in some form or another. So I think that, that we provide uh, tremendous services to our citizens. So you know, I, th I think it's pretty obvious I'm really excited about it um, and moving forward. So obviously I do support the, the proposal uh, that, that you have presented and really, really excited to, to get started. You know, I love the term no wrong door. Um, the fact that we have um, families in Cabarrus County that, um, that don't know where to turn and are not sh sure where to go and to know that there is a facility that, that they, can, they can go there and know that their needs are going to be taken care of regardless of, of, of which direction it would go. Um, the, you know, I like the flexibility and the fact that, that we can accommodate future changes in the laws. Uh, you know, we've, um, I did not know what an 1115 waiver was. As a matter of fact, I still get the numbers wrong, but have learned about that That's now. Right. <laughs> and and we, are, you know, we're, 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 we now know to advocate for that. Um, I, I made the mistake of uh, asking Marcella Bean uh, to give me some information on the IMD waivers, and she sent me about, uh, it felt like 10,000 pages of, of information. So it's very confusing when we've tried to have conversations with our federal elected officials uh, about the IMD waiver. 
they, look, they blankly stare at you and, and do not know what that is and what we're talking about. So, uh, and I think the same is true with the 1115 waiver as well. So, so for us to be able to advocate for that and, and to be able to benefit from those changes when, if they come in the future uh, is really exciting. So um, I, I hope you've gotten the feedback that you needed from this meeting tonight. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank okay. You. It's really a delight to work with the leadership and the people of this county so far. It's we, we really enjoy doing all the right things for all the right reasons. Right. So we're looking forward to this process with you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before we go to, to item 4.7, we've had Tracy LeCompte up here twice tonight. And both times I met, there was something laying at our places that says North Carolina State University on it. And I can't figure out what it is. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up. It is a uh, cord wrap. So for your power cords, for your computer, okay. you wrap your cord on there, it organizes it nice and neat. I had to ask the same thing, too. I love the university uh, and bringing all the technology. <laughs> all Thank you. Thank you for the cord wrap and for the explanation. <laughs> so. Helping people put knowledge to work. <laughs> exactly. That's us. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> and so now we move to item 4.7. We welcome Kasha Thompson back to talk about our strategic planning process. Hello again, and I bring with me Ellie Landrum, Hi. management analyst for the county, and Geraldine Gardner, who's the executive director of Central Line and was planning to be here since her regrets. She is got the cold that's got everybody under the weather right now so she is available to answer any questions and uh, can certainly dig into some of the details that we're going to discuss today so i want to start by recognizing that we just had the 230th anniversary of cabarrus county last week uh, and so that gives us some time to stop and pause and reflect on all the government that's happened in those 230 years and the vision that folks had before us and uh, take a pause and recognize that this is our chance to see where we want to go with the future of the organization. So with that, we'll start our discussion on strategic planning. So Cabarrus County's strategic plan, the current one, here we go, was developed in 2019 and improved in 2020. Uh, the plan focuses on five strategic priorities healthy and safe community, culture and recreation, sustainable growth and development, a thriving economy, transparent and accountable government. Now the plan had a lot of benefits, including staff awareness. This was the first time that we really came together and aligned our, businesses, our business processes with a plan. Uh, also, it made general connections between us and the community. It aligned our work with that of our partners. Uh, but there were a lot of challenges that came from that, so it's been a great learning opportunity. It's a very hefty plan if you've ever looked at it. Uh, it gets really into the weeds and into details. It's a catch-all for all the work that we're already doing, uh, rather than a focus on the vision and motivation for the next generation of our organization. And we've had some trouble uh, aligning goal measurement to the plan likely because it got so in the weeds that it was hard to get that high-level view. And then, you know, the COVID thing happened, right? So a lot has changed in the three years. COVID, workforce challenges, inflation. We have a new board now. The world isn't the same. Our residents aren't in the same place. And we're not the same organization we were just a few years ago, which is hard to believe how much uh, change there's been. We're now able to move mountains. We learned that we were able to move mountains throughout the last few years because we had processes in place. We had collaborations at work. People were communicating and we were addressing a hierarchy of needs and we did that very well. Uh, yet we were really not able to adopt the plan to it because it was so in the weeds, we weren't able to look at the big picture and make shifts and document it. Uh, the plan kind of sat on the shelf and we moved on with business and we, we <clears throat> We look back on it and we reference it, uh, but again, it's along the lines of business that we are already doing. Uh, so we used it to guide the future of our 
if we used it to guide the future of our organization, a lot would be missing if we just continued the work we have right now. So why do we need a strategic plan? Well, I like to think of it as a car tune-up ahead of a long trip, right? It's a diagnostic check to make sure our systems are working together, performing properly, and that the organization is ready to get where you want it to go. And I say you because this is the board's strategic plan. By the end of the planning process, our goal is to deliver a plan that the BOC unanimously approves, that drives our vision for the future of our organization by uniting the organization around common goals. And I stress organization, uh, you know, there might be some confusion. Are we developing a plan for what we want our community to look like in the next five years? Or um, that, that is not our intent. We want to drive what this organization looks like, what the business operations look like, and how we function internally. And of course, that has an outward impact as well. And it details the course of action we're going to take. It aligns with our responsibilities, timelines, and current and future resources, attainable and realistic, of course, in order to deliver effective and efficient services. We want to improve performance by including measures that track the impact we're making on the priority and how effectively and efficiently we're making it. We want a plan that incorporates feedback from stakeholders that is analyzed and prioritized. We want to leave room for flexibility to ensure survival and success, much like what happened the last time. We want a, we want a plan that we can mold around what the current circumstances are and that adapts to upcoming trends. And we want, to we want a plan that takes us where we want to be as an organization and community. We want to go down the road. Plan development. So the plan won't sit on the shelf. It's a living plan that informs decisions. We're very big on data-driven decision making and we're hoping to incorporate more of that into the board meetings. It'll be an active piece of our organizational framework. It'll become the basis for our culture through policy, performance, and mindset. So I want you to think about how we would have that trickle down to every level of government when our policies change to shape around this plan, when our performance and mindset change to shape around this plan, what our organization will be like. To make it happen, we're gonna set parameters. It's not connected to the current plan. It's based on the values, vision, and desired mission of commissioners. It's measurable, aligns with department work, visionary, so less nuts and bolts, and it's motivational. The plan will be useful at the department levels. Departments will know how they fit into the plan. Their goals will align with the plan, and individual work plans will align with their role within the department. And as a board, we wanna create a great experience for you. It's important you see yourself and those you represent in this plan. Your participation in this is key because over the next five years or so, we'll use the feedback you give us to inform our decisions. So while not everybody in the organization can come and present to you, they'll know where you stand and where we need to go as an organization and they'll have that as the basis of the smallest decisions that are made as an organization. Uh, we want to present a clear vision for the future, define which challenges will become priorities we can collectively overcome, evoke thought and inspiration throughout the process. So we're going to think through big questions like what will change if this happens and what will happen if we do not do this? Two very important things government has to consider. Staff in turn, while we're going to align strategies and workflow to foster collaboration and overcome challenges, we're also going to find ways to use resources wisely. We're gonna identify measures that allow for analysis and informed decision making. And we're gonna connect individual employees to the plan. We're gonna engage all stakeholders in successes, challenges, and growth, which is a very important component to us. That supports transparency, which we measured earlier in the survey, recognize and address roadblocks, and build a collective impact model. Along the way, we hope to use clear, simple, and direct language and graphics and benchmark our work against other successful jurisdictions by way of best practice certifications. All right, so our contractor that we're looking at working with for the plan development is Centralina. Ellie has done a great job of researching options. Uh, this is an investment in our future, right? And with that comes a cost. Staff asked respected agencies across the state for plan development proposals. So this is to get us through the next, this, this first chunk of developing the plan. 
The Central Line of Regional Council submission of 25 grand met several key objectives, including extensive research, advanced planning work, facilitation of multiple objective and engaging sessions, loops that incorporate board staff and community engagement, tried and true methodology, and a comprehensive final report. So there is an end product. Uh, there are many ways that they're going to participate. Uh, it's basically adding on staff for a concentrated amount of time that specializes in this work to make sure you get a great product. Uh, they're very familiar with our organization. Central Line of Regional Council is a trusted resource to the county, familiar with the unique challenges of our region. They offer flexibility to design a plan that fits our needs. They have a strong interest in supporting local government partners to develop a strategic plan that is meaningful and relevant to the long-term planning and annual operations of our organization. Uh, and they've been used by several uh, cities in the area and uh, have had great results there. And so our timeline for this work, that's uh, the chart that outlines where we wanna go with this. We would like to move our business and operations forward in alignment with the plan. So to do that, our, our main goal, Ellie and I, is to align the plan with the FY25 budget. So the plan that's created in June would not automatically roll out. What we would need then is time to work with departments to identify how we can uh, address those key areas. And then they would work with their staff to determine what resources they can throw at it, how the positions align with it, so that with the next budget, we will be clearly on path with this plan. We worked backward from that date to develop a timeline which requires us to start discussions about collaboration and alignment in early FY24. The duties you see outlined are divided between central line of staff members and two internal staff members. Community and employee feedback puts us ahead of the game. We've got uh, the community survey and an internal employee survey that went out that we'll get back in the next month or two. Uh, those will help inform your decisions and where you want to go with this. Central Lina is developing options for the board's involvement and community engagement around the plan. There are certain things you'll need to do each month, but how you do it, how you receive the information and, and uh, the way that we're able to deliver it to you, we have some flexibility on. We want to be cognizant of your time. And we'll use other tools and assessments to understand styles and perceptions in order to know how we can deliver you the information you want in the format you want it. So uh, the next steps would be a motion uh, to approve the outline strategic planning process. In January already, we're working with Central Lina, if this goes through, uh, to develop uh, information that would go out to commissioners and department heads to take the DISC assessment, measure performances and tendency, preferences and tendencies, inform staff on how to best communicate uh, with the board. Everybody has a communication style they prefer and we just wanna make sure we're, we're hitting all the marks and getting you what you want and how you want it. We'll do a research review and plan a February kickoff at the board retreat. So there's a lot of work to be done between now and the board retreat should you decide to move in this direction. So as you consider the motion, I wanna leave this up there. This is the information we've discussed today. It all comes back to helping you communicate a clear path to staff and help staff understand what you need to make the most important decisions that you face as a board of commissioners. By deciding this up front, we're hoping to streamline the process so that the smallest of decisions can be made with your guidance and in the best interest of your vision for the future of Cabarrus. So if it's the board's pleasure to move forward with Central Lina as the research, facilitation, development, and reporting vendor over the next six months, then we ask the board to suspend the rules and vote on the motion tonight. And we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for Kasha or Ellie and not Geraldine. Yeah. Geraldine will answer on a slight delay. Right. <laughs> And I really want to thank Ellie for her hard work on this plan. She's, uh, she's been very dedicated and is very excited to participate in this, as am I. And it's a new way of looking at our organization. Uh, like I said, the last plan kind of sat on the shelf outside of coming out for performance measures. And this is really a, a breathing document that, that's going to incorporate um, your vision into what we do every day. So the last plan. Um was in 2019. Right? It was. Okay. Was yeah. there one before that? 
We've done these throughout yeah. time okay. uh, with different facilitators uh, with different purposes. And I think uh, the investment the county has made in having staff dedicated to this is creating a link between the board and management uh, with the rest of the county employees. You have 20 different departments and community partners that need to fit into this plan. And so that's where Ellie and I come in is aligning those business processes and make sure that it follows through. Uh, normally, when when you start talking about strategic plan, I uh, groan or moan uh, because sometimes that self-evaluation and answering those questions can be a little painful. But I think probably, and, and somewhat contrary to what you said about the 220 plan uh, or 2020 plan, um, I, I think I have seen that applied more than ones that we have, have done previously yes. and and um, uh, I think it's a very valuable process um, I, I think it is is you know when, when we talk about you know the the amount of money that it costs to do that that may seem high to some uh, I think it's probably a pretty good deal when you look at the scope of issues that that come before us and the number of proposals that are made to us and there are far more than than what end up in these meetings to have that strategic plan as a guideline you know when when we are approached with a project or asked to deal with an issue and and we can tangibly evaluate that proposal and say how does this connect to our strategic plan Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. <clears throat> but to have that, that, that yardstick to, to measure those things by, I think is, is extremely valuable. Um, and, and certainly appreciate the, the, the work that, that you've done thus far in putting the pro proposal together. And I'm um, approaching this one with a great deal more enthusiasm than I may have some of the ones in the past. Um, and so I, no, no questions, really. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Does anybody else have anything? We do have a request to, um, to suspend the rules to take action on this item tonight. So I would entertain a motion to suspend the rules. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. That motion passes, and the requested action is a, and I would entertain a motion to approve the outline strategic planning process and budget amendment in the amount of $25,000 to come from the board's contingency. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion. Yeah, I'll just say I, I don't recall um, this the first time I was here, and, and maybe you know it happened, and maybe it was a little less low key. But um, I will be interested to see how this goes and working with you guys, and um, you know try to get, like you said, you know how we feel and having that implemented into the entire organization. So, um, so I'm happy to support this to to see where it goes, and and then we can evaluate in the future. Yes, absolutely. We can always reevaluate where we are. But thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay, we move now to item 4.8. Uh, resolution authorizing use of opioid settlement funds and Rodney Harris will lead us in that discussion. So I have some friends here, but I will start and then we'll see if you have questions. Um, so this is a little bit of cleanup that is required because the state uh, changed what they recommended for opioid settlement uh, approvals. <clears throat> and so back in November, the board committed to a local match of $70,000 per year over three years. This has a resolution to uh, authorize that expenditure. Um, so the state has come back in the last month or so and said that when we 
allocate opioid settlement dollars, they would like us to pass a resolution by the board. So we have taken their template, we have inputted that information, and then we're seeking your approval of that resolution tonight. Um, and again, we have the Health Alliance folks here uh, who will gladly answer any questions about the specific program if you would like. Yes, I was going to ask specifically what is the opioid, opioid settlement dollars? What is, what is this exactly? Um, so it's from a national settlement um, with the manufacturers um, okay. and pharmaceutical companies. And so we here locally are getting just under $11 million over the course of 18 years. Um, from these first batch of settlements. There are more settlements that are likely to come that will bring additional dollars. There are specific uses for those dollars, um, and so they have to go to specific types of programs aimed at opioid uh, recovery. And that, that, oh, that's administered through the Health Alliance, is that correct? The it is programs? administered by the county. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, so this particular program and award, which was the first we've done, is $210,000 to match this, and the Health Alliance will be managing this particular program. Okay. Does this go towards the sun? Is it the, no. s the sun program? This does not. No. Okay. I'm assuming some of these funds, as years go on, can be, oops, you know, allocated over to the um, mental health facility and, and spread out a couple different ways. Th that would be an option, correct? Okay. Um, and so there are some other programs that we've talked about. Uh, Medication-assisted treatment at the jail um, is something that the sheriff has interest in. Interest in. Uh, peer support services, um, other recovery services, but yeah, the behavioral health facility is an option. Okay. Hopefully, there will be a lot more funds to come because these are just the initial settlements. Uh, Cabarrus County was one of the leaders in the state in taking action for some of these settlements prior to the statewide um, agreement. Uh, we had tremendous leadership from the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners throughout the 100 counties in the state to all sign on to this agreement to, to move it forward. And so it is, it is ongoing, and there are other, other companies and other areas that are being explored. Uh, so this, this, this $70,000 has, I mean, we're getting $70,000 for it. So that, we're doubling our money on this. So you know, I would say that's, that's, that's a pretty good deal when we can take money that we receive for the settlement and put it to a good program and have it doubled um, is, is all the better. So I certainly am 100% in support of that. So basically, we've approved that this is just cleaning up this the This is details. just cleaning up the paperwork. Yep. All right. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Okay. We move now to item 4.9. Uh, Jim Howden from Finance. I was struggling with the initials uh, on, on, the, on this, and I'm used to saying Kaffir, but then I realized there's an A added to the beginning. That th threw me off. That was, that was a new change this year. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it, it's still the same instead of the comprehensive annual financial report. It's the annual comprehensive financial report. <clears throat> if you wanted me to go into the explanation of why it changed, I can do that, but it's... Not for my, okay. not, not okay. on my account. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm pleased to present the fiscal year 2022 annual comprehensive annual report, the ACFR. This document is prepared with great precision and involves a long process with the help from the whole entire finance department. Just to give you, am I going the wrong way? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start. But so just to give you some, uh, an overview of the whole document that we prepare here, it's 264 pages, 19 exhibits, 36 schedules, 17 tables, and a compliance section. We have a main operating fund, which is the general fund. 
uh, which also comprises the community investment fund. In addition to that, as you can see, there's nine capital project funds, nine special revenue funds, two custodial funds, one pension trust fund, two internal service funds, a CARES Act relief fund, an enterprise fund, and 66 pages of notes that back the financial statements. So I say all that to really thank the finance staff. Um, I want to give special thanks to Deputy Finance Director Suzanne Burgess, who organizes and manages this process each year. I also recognize the accounting supervisors that helped put this together, Katrina, Brenda, and Jenny, and the entire finance staff that spends extra time gathering the data for this, and the county manager's office, because without them and this whole group, putting this package together and doing the audit would not be possible. So the financial statements are prepared by the county and they're reviewed by our auditor, Martin Starnes, um, and then they are submitted to the LGC. We submitted our financials in, um, on December 1st of this year. Now the LGC does require that within 45 days, the board must accept the financials. So we are asking the board to suspend the rules of procedures tonight uh, because of this constraint and accept the financial statements today. So with that said, the, the main two things we want to talk about today is the audit and then do a high level overview of the general fund because that is the big fund that drives the county. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Matt Braswell. He is with, a senior manager with the accounting firm Martin Starnes and Associates. Matt has been with Martin Starnes for 15 years. He and his team um, performed the audit and the review of our financials before they were submitted to the LGC. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the board. Um, and it, it, as, as Jim stated, this is a lot of information to go through to prepare. Um, there is a this is a year-round process. The audit. Once we get your contract approved in February, March, we continue to we go ahead and start on your federal and single audit. We go ahead and do planning preliminary. Go through the new standards. We had GASB 87 this year, which was a lot of information that was added to your statements as well. And so um, we just want to take another another second to to thank Jim and his staff, Suzanne, everyone from from payroll to DSS health department, everyone that. That, that we have to interact with, um, just a pleasure to work with. Um, get us everything that we need to do our job in a timely manner, responding to emails, responding, and um, you would think that wouldn't be a hard thing to do, but, but working on 20 or 20 so jobs <clears throat> that I work on a yearly basis, um, it is very appreciative, we're very appreciative of, of Cabarrus County um, as, a, as a client of ours, and we do not take that lightly. So we do appreciate your staff and everything that, that everyone does here. Um, just to go through a few audit highlights from, from my perspective as a third party independent auditor, we issued an unmodified opinion, which that means your financial statements, that is a clean opinion. That means that the financial statements, the 264 pages of documents that we have reviewed and went through are materially correct and in accordance with GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. We had no statement, no financial statement findings, nothing that we feel that we need to bring to the board's attention or anything that we found out of the norm within the scope of the audit. Uh, no single audit findings, and what that means is you have a lot of federal and state awards that go through Cabarrus County that are administered through DSS, through Health Department, everything like that. And so um, we tested roughly six to eight programs of your large dollars, uh, emergency rental assistance programs, Medicaid, all those programs. And um, your staff come through all of those testings um, without any issues or anything we had to bring to your attention. So that is, that is very, very good. Um, so we issued an unmodified opinion on your federal and state programs as well. So overall, um, from our opinion, third party opinion, um, Cabarrus County did very, very well. I'll hand it back over to Jim. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions for Matt before yes. we move on? Okay. So let's talk about the general fund. The general fund for fiscal year 2022 had a budget of $326 million. Revenues were over budget by $17.7 million. Expenditures were under budget, $25.8 million. And we added $22.9 million to the general fund fund balance. So let's talk about the two big drivers for revenue. 
of course, are property taxes and sales tax. For property tax, we budgeted $213 million in fiscal year 2022. We actually received $221 million, which is $8 million over budget. Two big drivers for this. One is collections. The tax department did a great job collecting 99.4%, 03 uh, more than they did last year. And the other big increase is the ad of valorium values are up $1.2 billion. We were at $28.8 billion in 2021, and now we're at roughly $30 billion in value in the county, which is great. Um, this is just a graph for property taxes over the past four years where you can see it has gone up. Keep in mind between fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21, the big increase was because that was a reval year. Um, but again, this was just to, to show you there are some, we, we are increasing with the values each and every year. Blank page, we'll just skip. Uh, sales tax for fiscal year 2022, we budgeted $61 million, and we, when we budget this, we actually put it in the general fund and the community investment fund, but for this report, we do combine them. We collected $72.6 million, $11.6 million over budget. Uh, the big drivers for that, purchases. Inflation, of course, online purchases. Um, big question is, can it continue? And I think that depends who you talk to. There's some people that say it can, there's some people that say it can't. Um, so I think each year we want to be conservative in how we budget for it. But, but so far through, I think we have through October, um, it's, we're above budget. We're above, uh, for fiscal year 23, we're above where we were for fiscal year 22. So it's looking pretty good. Uh, expenditure summary. So we're $25.8 million under budget in expenditures, which is roughly 10%. Uh, salary and benefits, we had a budget of $95.3 million, $5.2 million unspent. And, and the cause for this is lapsed salaries. Um, this is either new positions that were approved the prior year during the budget, budget process that these people did not start July 1st, or somebody leaves the county and we're trying to hire their, their spot back and it does take a little bit of time. We did break this down into various categories, various groups. General government was roughly 2.3 million unspent. Keep in mind, I've only listed four departments, but all the other departments besides sheriff and emergency services and human services are in this category. Uh, public safety, sheriff, emergency services, 1 million, and human services, 1.5 unspent in salaries. We did have 1.6 million unspent in economic incentive grants. Um, this would be mainly tied to timing. We, we are having, as we have new development come in or companies expanding um, with the logistics and supply chain issues we've been having, some of the projects that were supposed to be up and started already are a little bit behind, and these funds are reappropriated for fiscal year 2023. $4.9 million in capital purchases unspent. Now, these are not capital projects. These are actual capital purchases within the general fund. Uh, as you can see, if you look, the, the fleet, transportation, and $1.1 million for public safety are vehicle-related, either vehicles, ambulances, uh, deputy vehicles, and the equipment associated with it. Um, we were just unable to purchase those items uh, because of the supply chain. Those fun Now, there are some scenarios where we potentially purchased a vehicle less than what we budgeted, but that's very rare. Um, so anything that need to be uh, reappropriated and carried over to the fiscal year 2023 was that we did do that. Operational costs. This is really everything else. It's under budget 14.1 billion. I'm sorry, million, not billion. Um, this is really the department's being conservative and spending. And also there is some timing here. Um, if, if Purchases were not available at the time. We may have reappropriated this for fiscal year 2023 also. Some of this is programs and, and purchases that the departments decide they didn't need. Maybe that's tied to lapsed salaries and employees not in yet. So to purchase new furniture for them or their equipment um, just didn't happen. 
So with all that said, we get to the general fund fund balance. Now, um, as I said, we put 20, sorry, let me get the right number. We added $22.9 million to the general fund balance in fiscal year 22 to get that total balance to $177.8 million. Now keep in mind that some of that is restricted, 49.1 million, which is grant or state, federal, uh, statutorily, it is, we have to spend it on what that program was for, so it's not available for us. There's some that's non-spendable, mainly inventory, that's, that we have a product, so it's not cash. Committed and assigned, 55.8 million are, are things that this board or, or management has um, committed or assigned those funds for, various contracts, projects, and so forth. And unrestricted is 72.6 million. Now, with that, and, and I think it's the next item on the agenda, the county does have a, a policy in place where 15% of the unrestricted, uh, 15 per, so anything excess of 15% over the current year's expenditure budget, which is roughly 325 million, which comes down to 49.2 million, can be, and the policy says, to be transferred to CIF for future projects. And we can go more detail on that with the next agenda item. And, and so just to, just to touch base on the general fund summary here, um, as, as, as a board, as uh, talking to Jim here, the, the kind of to look at your reserves a little bit, your unassigned or unrestricted fund balance as a percentage of expenditures, you kind of want to look and see what reserves you have on hand. And so roughly the LGC looks at 8% is roughly one month supply on hand. So if you compare last year, 2021 to 2022, you roughly have about 20% uh, unassigned fund balance as a percentage of your expenditures. It's a little, if you look at your MBNA from last year to this year, it's 19.8, roughly 20%. So even though you added, um, you added more fund balance or substantial amount of fund balance to the total fund balance, you as a board have placed either committed or assigned or some of it's restricted, different things like that, but you still have the same amount of, of reserves for your unassigned fund balance as you did in the previous year. So um, just wanted to touch base on that. And that is the summary of the general fund um, and the presentation. Is there any questions? Yeah, so back in 2020, we created the Community Investment Fund, which um, oftentimes is referred to as a debt service fund. So we used to do all of our capital projects debt funding out of the general fund, and so the funds were commingled. Uh, this has separated them out and created a dedicated revenue stream, uh, both from the general fund, sales tax, um, property tax, lottery proceeds, et cetera, to cover our capital projects. And so that fund is self-contained. It carries its own fund balance, and we use that to plan out our capital program. Other questions? Or is everybody dizzy like me <laughs> after Sorry. all those numbers? We, we will provide everyone a hard copy. We're going to get them all bounded and we'll get one to the commissioners. Yeah, so I got a question. You guys are asking for us to suspend the rules this evening to approve this. Is that correct? Yeah, you're just accepting, Except, is that the proper? Correct. You're accepting the financial report? Correct. We have 45 days from when we gave it to the LGC. Okay. So I shouldn't have, uh, yeah, accepting, because, uh, you but know. There's really nothing to approve. Right. But basically, it's um, the LGC, what, what has run to run into in the past, the LGC, there's various smaller units or different things that, um, had come back and, and said that they may not have seen this information or had a report from a third party auditor or different things like that. And so they, and when you look at your data input sheet that we have to submit with the audit, we have to put a specific day when we're going to come before the board and present the numbers with the finance director, go over our findings, go over our opinion and everything like that. So it's, uh, they've just put another kind of 
in place there to to make sure that you are seeing this information and it's not you know if, if something comes up that you haven't seen this information okay. so, so you'll be back when you'll be back no 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 this this is this is to go over the audit was submitted on december the first so within that 45 day window of the audit being submitted to the lgc i have to come before you the board or someone from your third party auditor needs to present your your statements everything to make sure right so the so then when will we have the audit report then you should have an electric co uh, electronic copy. We will have a bound copy once I just got the, the we have special binders and different things from, from the county that we have to bind those. So it should be within, I would say a week or two, the bound copies. But the, we get you electronic, it, it should be part of the agenda book. Yeah, we can, it, right. It, it was, it was, but it was a lot of information and I just received it Thursday evening. So trying to do that Friday, Saturday, you know, Sunday today, I feel like it's a lot of information to absorb to then ask to be accepted this evening. Um, that's that's my concern. But what is the absolute deadline that you have to turn this around in? Just out of curiosity. I think it is December 15th. Or January 15th. Or January 15th. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Thank you mm -hmm. for correcting me. Which, and I think the board meets on January 17th. 17th. accepted what do you mean by accepted for the board's purposes Not that I have presented to you the you know our opinions different things like that that, that I have as an auditor done my due diligence and and, right. and presented to the board that a there's no findings no issues or anything that we have to address that you need to look at right now that so that's that's basically it yeah, you're, not, you're not proving the document you're just right. saying that you're accepting that, that he, yeah that, that's been audited I'm, Matt has I'm, but, you know. I understand, but I mean, it's difficult to read that amount of information and absorb it. And then I understand that we're just accepting it, but, um, you know, to, it, it, you know, for my, you know, been best, I feel like to be able to really read it, absorb it for days at a time instead of, um, but anyway, that's just my opinion. Jim, and, the, and if there is a, a, a not to com, you know condense all the information or anything like that but if there is to to get a, a quick snapshot of everything there is a section called management discussion and analysis in the first part of the report that uh, that management and everything basically it condenses all the information into about a 10 10 to 12 page document yes. that goes it gives you a it's a high level snapshot on what your fund balance is what everything that kind of took place in the year it's kind of a snapshot because you can get lost in all of these schedules and all of the 66 pages of notes and everything so the management discussion and analysis if you can see um, let me see what page that is on um, page 12 I believe or 13 page 13 um, you'll see financial highlights that'll kind of and so it goes from 13 to 20 25 and it even goes over what your next year's budget looks like, different things. And so that is a high level um, snapshot of everything that took place for the year. And Jim, to address that concern in future years, would it be possible to provide it to the board through the manager when it is sent to the LGC? Once it's approved by the LGC, we could do that, yes. And it's usually approved a few days later. Yeah. So, so yes. we. If we timed it right, we could maybe get it in December's where we had the whole month. The LGC is sometimes uh, they are delayed in, in turning things around and approving reports and, and things of that nature because they get a lot in that November first part because that's when you have to amend the contract. So that's kind of the last days there um, that uh, they get a lot of information and they're a little understaffed as well at the LGC. So uh, they're they're not as quickly turning reports around. So. Right. Um, well, and, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, anything's been done wrong or anything of that nature. You know, I, it's, it's just difficult to vote on something, even if we're just accepting it, you know, without being able to just fully absorb all the information. So, I mean, if we could in the future, you know, move that back to where we can, if the timing will work out right, um, that would be great. Yes, sir. We'll work on it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, it's, um, 
uh, I, I like the process. I like the fact that our community investment fund, uh, I can remember in previous years when it was sort of a haphazard, okay, this is how much revenue over expenses, uh, what, what are we going to do with it? And, that, and so to have a plan in place, I think, is, uh, is very beneficial. So compliments to all of you folks that have put that together. If there are no further dis, uh, questions, at this time I would entertain a motion to suspend the rules of procedure to take action on this to meet the uh, Local Government Commission deadlines. So moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? How long, how long have <clears throat> we used this firm? Two, two or three, two or three years. So two to when three cycles of this, mm -hmm. have we ever had any issues with accepting? Mm -mm. Okay. No, sir. Okay, any other discussion? If there's none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And at this time, I would entertain a motion to accept the fiscal year 2022 annual comprehensive financial report as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think Mr. Howden has the next item as well. So this is in regards to what we talked about, the Community Investment Fund. Uh, per the county's <clears throat> financial and budgetary policies, the sum of the general fund, op general operating fund, unrestricted fund balance, in excess of 15% of the current year budget, um, is available to transfer and appropriate to the community investment fund. Um, that number, as per the backup, is actually $23.4 million. The board already this fiscal year has appropriated 3.9 million from fund balance to various capital projects. So we are recommending we would remove that. We are also recommending that $1,950,500 um, be budgeted, of this fund, be budgeted for the broadband program. Now, the, the program for broadband was actually approved last year for $2 million. In the fiscal year 2023 budget, it's only budgeted for 50,000. So this has just given us the rest of those funds that we should have already reappropriated. So we would actually, what we're asking the board to approve along with the budget is to transfer $17,520,532 from the general fund to the community investment fund. And just to elaborate on this, so of that 17.5 million, roughly 1.3 million is going to be allocated or, or stay within the community investment fund um, to make the model sustainable. So what we're looking at is roughly $16 million that can be allocated to capital projects. Um, so this will be available for PAYGO as we move into next fiscal year. Um, we'll have roughly this 16 million plus an additional 4 million annually that we get from the CIF for PAYGO. So about $20 million that can go towards capital needs. Okay, questions on that one, commissioners? All right, thank you very much. Thank we you move much. to item 4.11 from Human Resources, Personnel Ordinance Updates, Leave of Absences. Lundy Covington will lead that discussion. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I do have a few changes I want to run by you this evening. I also was assisted with a few of these by John Bradley and David Goldberg, so I believe they're both still in the audience. And if you have any questions, I may call them up to assist me with that. So, Lauren, are you able to pull up the, yep. In your packet, you'll have um, the current ordinance language as well as either track changes or red highlighted so you can see what we're proposing. Um, the first item I want to cover isn't actually leave of absence, but it's a very small change in our classification <coughs> plan section. 
And this is basically just inserting a few additional examples. Um, for those who were on the board at the time, you may recall we had an ITS comp study project back in the summer, and that included some um, ladder or career progression changes. So this is just simply adding a few of those examples in. We had um, an occasion recently to utilize that and realized it would help to have a little bit of a better bridge between that project that was approved as um, into the current ordinance. So that's simply that change. Um, the next item is in the workers' comp area. So I'm definitely going to my notes on this one, and this is where I might need John to bail me out a bit. But um, this change is basically to update the described process and to make sure we're consistent with how other local government entities are utilizing their seven-day waiting process under workers' compensation. So if an employee is injured on the job, they must satisfy a seven-day waiting period before workers' comp will be paid for time that's missed work. Um, employees are allowed right now to use their applicable or available accrued time during the waiting period. Um, workers' comp compensation for the seven-day waiting period is paid only after a worker has been out of work for at least 21 days, and it has to, of course, be an approved claim um, after an injury or contracting an occupational disease, and we would basically be following the North Carolina Workers' Comp Act for that. Um, the personnel ordinance basically states we will, we will reinstate their time used to their employee accrual bank after they meet the seven-day waiting period. So that's basically what it says now. That has proven to be administratively challenging for our finance group, um, and it basically allows the employee to recoup and reuse that time. So what we're seeking to do in this section is going forward, they'll still have the ability to use their time when they're out during that seven days, but the time will then not be returned to their bank after they meet the seven-day waiting period. So hopefully that was clear enough. But again, if you have questions, I've got John to assist. Is that making sense? We're just trying not to allow refurbishing the bank so they'll still get paid the time when they need it. And we do find that employees do need that when they're in that waiting period window. And so they use their accrued their time, time sick time, vacation to time. To get paid during that seven-day waiting period. But then, if their workman's comp claim is approved, then then they pick up from there. No, I really don't understand. Are, are we not penalizing <laughs> them by not giving that, that time back? Well, they're getting paid the time, and they're getting paid from comp claims. or yeah. our So they're already, in essence, getting that, and it almost seems like we're tripling up if we allow them to put the time back into their bank. I mean, that was kind of our Okay, so process. when when their claim is approved, then they go back and pay them from the first day. Not until they've missed more than 21 days of work. But if they miss 21 days of work, they go back to day one. So in essence, they get paid twice for that first seven yes. days. Okay, that makes sense. At the though. workers' compensation rate, though. So it's only two-thirds right. of their pay. Right, right. And so what we've been doing is if they met that test, we've been paying, paying them. And then, like you said, tripling up and then allow, yeah, so, yeah, that does make sense. Okay. All right. And then the third section is our military leave. And what we are basically asking to do here is just include federal disaster service leave into this section, kind of expanding that section a bit. Um, so basically, we currently have a policy in, pay, in place that pays our employees who are out on military leave. In addition to that, they're paid 120 hours per year if they're called up for either training or if they're deployed. Once that time is exhausted, that's all they'll get for that calendar year. So in many cases, um, you know, it's either the 120 hours if they're deployed for a lengthier period of time, or it might be just that training involvement. In addition to that, though, we also have to follow the unit the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, which is USERA, and that's also incorporated into that section. What has happened recently is USERA has been updated to include FEMA employees and other disaster services personnel, and what we would like to propose here is extending the paid leave to that group of employees as well 
to um, you know, kind of recognize them for their service during a time of disaster. We absolutely have to follow you, Sarah, but we're just trying to add that paid leave for that group as well. So those are the changes that you'll see in there. And again, David Goldberg assisted with this to make sure we're legally in compliance, but because it is an additional compensation item, we wanna make sure you're supportive of that as well. We would require anyone who is being deployed to provide proof to us whatever kind of leave it is. So we have a system in place to make sure it would not be abused. So any questions on that section? Good. All right, thank you so okay. much. Appreciate thank your time. Thank you. Okay, we move now to item 4.12, uh, Cabarrus County Library and Active Living Center at Mount Pleasant and Virginia Fall Park update. And we have down Kyle and Rodney, and it looks like Michael as well. Okay, so concerning uh, the Mount Pleasant, uh, uh, Cabarrus County Library and Active Living Center at Mount Pleasant and the Virginia Foil Park project update and the current design development cost estimate from the construction manager at risk. So it's kind of what I wanna present, it's a lot of it. So first off, I'll give you an update of where we are on the project. We're sitting done with design development. So as you go through the different processes and I'll talk to this board like I have, like your first time board as we go through these design projects. You go through programming, you go through schematic design, you go through DD or design documents, and that's kind of really where you start to shape up your dollar values and your numbers, okay? And then you go to construction documents, so that's the final process. So we're sitting right now, not moving into that process until we, we discuss what the DD cost estimates were. Um, and again, we came to the board in April to discuss the original schematic estimates that we were getting and to make sure that we were within the realm that we were supposed to be moving forward. And the board at that point gave us the approval to move forward to $26.5 million for the park and the library. And this spreadsheet, the, specifically the blue one that I've provided that summarizes everything from the construction manager at risk as well as the design team to try to give you one comprehensive one page versus 52 pages to read through that kind of summarizes where we're sitting at. So I just wanna, that gives an update of where we are in the process. So we are not authorizing the design team to move forward with any construction documents until I hear from the board tonight and get a general indication of which way we wanna start moving forward. And you understand that this slows the entire process down to, to open up the facilities. Okay, so the, the DD estimates came, at, came back with not taking any of the alternates into account the construction cost as well as the estimates for all of the FF&E, so the furniture and finishes and the equipment and everything that the county would buy and put in there. So audio visual, um, a couch, uh, bookshelves, the actual books on the shelves, all of that, those numbers is that first, I guess I should say that second yellow row about mid page down where it says 25, 185999.96. So that is under the 26.5 that the board approved us to move forward with in April. If we were to look at taking any of these alternates, then we're going to start needing to discuss is yes, I can add them and we can maybe get right up to that 26.5, but this is just DD estimates. So we have a whole nother five to six months to go through as we go into these details and the market changes. Now the market could change for the better and the market could change for the worse. So over the past three years, I've sat up in front of this board a lot with DD estimates, CD estimates, schematic design estimates. I've come back for GMPs. I've changed this, I've changed that. I valued engineered out. And I'm gonna tell you that right now, in my opinion, I don't see the market changing that much from now to then. But these are all our alternates. It's not hurting us to bid them out and we will bid them out and we will move forward. But I do need to give direction to the team that says we're okay with moving forward on the design of, of, of all of this complex. So that is the library, the active living center and the actual athletic amenities or Virginia Foil Park. 
So I, I'm willing to take questions. There might be some questions about these alternates. I've tried to really list them out in verbiage that everybody would understand. Um, and again, I will have to come up in front of the board after we physically go through the actual GMP bid and say, what are we choosing? What are we not choosing? And the problem is, is that some of these carry different um, impacts. So for, for example, if you take one of the multi-sport multi fields, you're also going to go ahead and take the restroom for it because you're gonna be so far away from the other playing fields that you're not gonna meet ADA compliance in terms of the restroom. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a domino effect. So staff has already met internally to kind of go through these and we'll be meeting with the Active Living and Parks Department to talk through them. We're not slowing anything down because they're still just as alternates. But I wanna make sure everyone sees these dollars and understands that if the board wants us to move past that 26.5, meaning if these values, whether it's the base bid or the alternates tip over 26.5 million, the board will need to authorize the transfer of more funds for the project. And that as of right now, I'm operating as the cap is 26.5. And uh, there's also some unknowns in there that, you know, those FF and E numbers, you know, furniture kind of trends with the actual um, construction market, unfortunately. So what you're saying is <clears throat> if we go down to alternate number two, multi-sport soccer field number two, if we don't do that, and we definitely don't do need to do the next one, which is the storage building and restrooms that go with it. Yeah, I would tell you if you don't do one or two, then you wouldn't do three. That is correct. Yeah. So then you could start looking at, you know, do we want a picnic shelter and do we want a... Uh, I'm sorry, a storage and pavilion next to the playground because that, that's in what I will call phase one of the park, meaning not any of the alternate area, which is the, the side um, towards the south of the property. And, and then I will also tell you that you obviously, you can't light soccer fields if you don't build them. So, right. um, so that's why I said a lot of these are connected with each other. Uh, and, and I'd love to get guidance from the board now. I'm just not really sure that you can make your decisions on alternates without seeing the final pricing. But this is enough where we were so close to that number that I really wanted to see everybody see it broken down by dollar. I, li I like the way it's organized, the, the sheet. So Is that the colors I use? I guess. Okay. I, I, blue, I love blue. I, so. I, I, I debated heavily on the blue. So. Um, well, anyway, thank you. It's very yeah. well organized. Yep. So. And so in the <clears throat> original um, t total cost, none of the outdoor fields are included? Uh, the base bid includes all of the ball fields. Ball. So um, let me okay. be careful. Ba baseball and softball. Sorry, uh -huh. we use ball fields and soccer as our two terminologies. So right. That, but yes, the, the, um, the three field wagon wheel is is in the base bid so this is just for what i will they're calling multi-purpose fields but um soccer lacrosse or cricket or whatever have you so just for clarification which line <clears throat> in that upper portion that 25 185.99 are the ball fields in the uh, second line DD estimate of construction costs on 12, 16, 22. Okay. The, it's included in there. <clears throat> gotcha. That is the base bid. Um, and the original renderings that went out to the board, which I think might be on this, because mm -hmm. I think they were so big as a, a PDF, they were difficult yeah, they were to about 10 up. pages, I think. Of, yeah, yeah, it's just the quality. It makes, yeah. it makes the content so high. So if you go back one, no, you're fine. So, um, the asterisks didn't show up as well as I had anticipated, but those are the alternates, is, is those two fields is showing you, and then the amenities that come along with it, which is that re that additional restroom facility. The parking lot is part of the base bid. That parking lot is part of the base bid. You won't be able to operate the facility without that parking lot. It looks like a lot of fields for a little parking. Is that... 
an accurate well, you still have parking that goes up from wraps behind, behind the, the library. library. It, it is. It, it's over 300 for the whole complex. We, we've had this debate over and over. My, during the, the public meetings, my exact comment was, I can give you more parking. We'll just take one of those multipurpose fields. Right. Because that's, that's pretty much where you're at at this point. I because mean, this is the total footprint yeah, of the property. I mean, there's nowhere else I can go. We, right. we, we've squeezed stormwater BMPs. Um, and if you kind of notice, we've had to do some different things with swales. Uh, this The topography doesn't show it, but there's specific reasons why I'm putting some of the trees where I am is to avoid people parking in certain places that have utility lines running underneath them. I agree with what you said. I think I think we need to know what it's going to cost and have the bids before we make a decision on it. Yeah, I'm just worried about, um, you know, typically when I come to you all, you don't have that much time to make those decisions. And I thought that this was a good, a good time to put these things up in front of you so that when I came back, you could be, oh yeah, I remember having that conversation. So it just wasn't all at once because typically, the way that the when you're doing a, a construction manager at risk and your GMPs and your bids, those those bids from the subs are only good for so long. And when they get that all up and they quality control all that and they get it to us, they never give us a great amount of turnaround time. So I wanted to make sure everyone saw this and, and when Commissioner Meesmer commented about the sheet, that's really why I put that all in there because you're combining all this information from different folks and I was just trying to put it there so you could have a reference point for when I come up to you the next time. If, if you were looking for guidance, I, that's what we were just talking about. I think you could do away with the artificial turf for the three baseball fields and still get most of those other alternates in there. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you don't have to cut actual fields. You're just doing away with the artificial turf for the baseball. Well, that artificial turf, meaning taking the, the 628 away from the 2.5 and then taking what's left and putting it back in there? Yep. Yep. And that yep. way you, you get the most mm -hmm. that you can. Yep. Well, what, what, what Kyle's working on is the 26.5 for that first group. So anything that may be $200,000 left or there may be a million dollars left. Whatever that is left, if it comes under the 26.5, then you guys will have a laundry list down there that you can start making from. But you just want us to move forward with this where it says 25.185. I want you all to be aware of what the market's doing right now so that when I come back up to you, nobody is surprised. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really, I, I very much want you all to understand what these things are costing to provide. Just to add one more piece to it. So we're focusing on the capital expenditure, but there's also an operating impact um, to this facility. So. <clears throat> not as much in the, the front end, so not as much in the building because we have existing Mount Pleasant Library staff that can move over, so we do need a couple of additional staff members and then active living. We'll need probably one or two additional part-time staff members, maybe full-time. Um, we don't have a park currently, and so what we're talking about is a park amenity that has to be staffed with a park ranger. We're also talking about grounds maintenance, um, so if we do both multi-purpose fields, that's more grounds maintenance expense. Uh, on behalf of the county and so just keep that in mind is, as we have these discussions it's not just that capital expenditure piece but it's also the impact on the operating budget so the operating expense that comes along with those fields in terms of do you contract it out you know are you you spraying them how are you managing them what type of herbicide are you putting on are you limiting play and not limiting play all that stuff goes into creating that higher operating expense that rodney's talking about number we are working with is the 265 okay now i guess another question i would ask is what how is the operating expense impacted if we if we took away the artificial turf and then replaced it with real turf that would have to be fertilized and watered and mowed and et cetera we, there, there's a lot of uh, conflicting uh, viewpoints on synthetic versus uh, natural, just so you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it depends on your substrate. So for, at Frank Lisk on the soccer fields, I will tell you that it is very difficult to maintain 
natural turf there. Um, we had to bring in all of that substrate from a different geographic location because it's built on an iron plate. That's, that's why there's a tower there. So you see rock outcroppings everywhere. It, it's, that's normal. That's where they are everywhere up there. I don't know that the bang is worth the buck um, on synthetic turf. We've had a lot of folks look at it. Um, we've had our staff look at it and Michael look at it down there. And I'm not 100% sure that we feel that we that it's going to, in the long run, in terms of replacing it after 15 years, that the ROI is worth it. And the cost of replacement is pretty high. It is. It, uh, again, uh, not to be funny, but it's driven by the market, literally, what that material is made of. Um, and then, you know, you have the decisions. Are you... Are you using the, the certain type of substrate that cools itself? Are you spraying water on it? You know, are you going to be out there and telling kids when it's too hot, no, you can't go on here? There's a lot of responsibility that, that goes with some of that stuff. But then on, on the flip side of it, it's Sunday and it's raining and 27 people go out there and decide to have a tackle football game and you have no turf for the kids on Monday. And that's a reality too. Oh, yeah. sure. Now, um as far as operating costs, what has there been amount budgeted for that? With just so it's it's an estimate has been built into the five year plan right. um, for all of these capital projects, but we are working to finalize based on the final uh, square footage what those needs okay. are. Because it would be interesting to know, right? So it's been built into the five year plan, so it's going along. But if we decide to go with all the extras, what additional operational costs we would have that would be interesting to know yeah and i think that's less staffing and more operating okay. yes yeah. i think that's like two people okay. they can sit down and, and try to figure that out so my problem with all that and, and people ask me for operating expenses all the time and most of the spreadsheets that rodney gets and and most of the emails that you all ask me for about operating expenses is is comes out a lot of my head because i'm the circle of maintaining them and building them and that's really difficult to do like it's okay to look conceptually at that that plan and say okay this is how much it's going to take to mow those fields but all of a sudden you you don't know where the soft spots are going to be and how often you know you have um irrigation breaks on there because everybody is constantly parking where they're not supposed to and and so it's not where i get you is grenades distance it is not um you know, okay. a, a shot to the heart, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay. And that's why in the email when you asked about a different building's operating right. expense, I said you really have to get through year one before I can, I can truly, truly tell you. Now, I can tell you that you add two multipurpose fields down there. I can tell you right now you'll go up by $40,000 a year in, in mowing and treatments and everything for it just be based on those fields. <clears throat> but if you don't build them, you'll just have grass down there they won't be you know the type of fields that you would play on but i'm sure people will still use them to go throw a frisbee or, or what have you um but you won't spend that sheer amount of money taking care of them like right. that okay additional questions so what your goal tonight was for us to be forewarned and somewhat <laughs> pre-educated uh, for decisions that will come later on. Yes. Uh, w when I wrote this, I just wanted to make sure that everybody remembered what the board told us back in April, which is the 26.5. And I'd kind of had to write this motion where it might have to change on the fly. But yes, I want everybody to be aware and understand because I, I have a feeling that based on the market, I'll be coming to you, uh, hopefully not as much of a hurry as I did with GMP3 for the courthouse, but something somewhat similar, to be honest with you. So I was going to ask you if it would be fair for me to say that there is an extremely high likelihood that when you come back, you're going to request that we suspend the rules and take action at the work session. I try to avoid that, but obviously uh, my reputation precedes me. So yes, that's <laughs> most likely going to happen. Okay, just, just checking that out. Yeah, that's, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, we'll move to the next item. Just one quick note uh, just for the board. Um, so we did get a $500,000 grant for the park component of this project um, from the Park and Recreation Trust Fund um, that will help 
with the cost. Uh, and then the other part is the existing ball fields uh, that we currently own could be sold um, once these fields are open. Great. Thank you. Hey, we've, we've had some inquiries about it for, for, for various uses. Okay. City of Concord Public Utility Easement. Uh, so this is specifically about the public plaza that I will say connects um, Union and Church Street and, and leads to the front entrance of the courthouse. Um, for you, for those of you that have been here for a while, you understand that that used to be Means Avenue. It's no longer Means Avenue. It's the public plaza. Um, all of the utilities for several um, locations in downtown, obviously our buildings entirely, 100%. The utilities run under there in terms of the courthouse and the store courthouse, but also um, the old First Union or Wachovia Bank building. I have a significant amount of utilities under there that feed them. So we are required to go into a actual easement, a public utility easement for that whole public plaza. This reads different than a lot of the easements that we bring up to you all. Um, because it actually had to be reworded about 17 different times to make sure that we accounted for the type of hardscape and substrate that is underneath that plaza. It's very different than just uh, potholing or digging up a road. Um, so we were able to get um, all that verbiage the way that we wanted to, and I worked with legal counsel on that. Questions on that item? Okay, we'll move to 4.14. Frank Lisk Park, office, restroom, concessions, mini golf, et cetera. Okay, so um, when I just met with you about the Mount Pleasant project, I kind of discussed the different steps of a design. You go through programming, schematic, design development, construction development. So we've started the programming on the replacement of the parks office at Frank Lisk Park. So to orient you, I think I did put an aerial on here that might help. Okay, so that's the parking lot and it's next to the mini golf. So people call that the park's office, but that is actually the park's office, the restrooms, the concession stand, and the storage. Um, and to give you an idea, that's, that's right across from the barn that's, that's being built. Um, so we've had a CIP to replace that building, to increase the size, um, specifically to make it ADA compliant. Um, in the bathroom specifically, and also to make the mini golf ADA compliant. They are not. The way the law reads is 50% of your holes have to be ADA compliant, which if you know anything about mini golf, it means large sways and areas where you can get around to do that. So we've had this CIP. We had noted this uh, probably maybe even six years ago mm -hmm. in our ADA assessment of the park. Um, and through our first uh, opinionated projection costs, um, the architect just going through programming, no design development. Um, we're looking to be about $900,000 short. And what we had in there, we currently have $1.2 million in there. And for the building in the course, um, you're looking at about just over $2 million. And that's has a only has a 3% escalation, which I asked them to use numbers bigger than three after the last six months. So um, I'm trying to gauge the board um, in terms of, do you want county staff to try to um, identify funds in the capital fund, or do you want us to stand down on this project or move forward? I've kind of squeezed a lot of the square footage out of the building they're proposing building. So they're not gonna have conference rooms or anything like that. They're gonna have enough offices for the people that are on staff, and they're basically gonna have a break room and then the bulk of it's gonna to go to restroom storage and concessions. And in terms of the mini golf, we've made it very clear that we're not talking about, you know, things that have three different hinge points and activities. Yes, there will be something out there, but it won't be the, the windmill or the clown that yells at you when you don't, you know, put it in the hole. It won't be that extravagant. It was enough to get us by as a basic golf course. 
So what are the legal requirements as far as meeting the ADA requirements on both the restrooms and the golf course? Well, eventually, I think I think Rowan went through this. If I'm they not, went fully. Yeah, they accessible. went fully accessible as is what we're doing also. But eventually, you'll get a complaint from somebody, and you'll just have to shut it down. Meaning, if you if you can't provide it to be accessible, you're gonna have to shut it down. So right. we we've had this CIP in there long enough. I'm kind of kind of surprised no one's come looking for us being like hey isn't that CIP in there you're supposed to do well, that. after our conversation tonight <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm sure I just set that Probably up will. Yeah. You said for six years? I, we identified it's it like six years ago yeah we, we have a lot of we have a lot of projects out there that we try to pick and choose each year to fit into the budget that's why it's taken six years and yeah I, I'm, priorities and sometimes they rise at the top and then they drop and then they may rise at the top yeah, we have to we have to look at things like if you need a new chiller for a building or a new roof, that that takes a priority. And and a lot of over the years, a lot of our capital funding, you know, we have the schools too. So there's been times where we're basically playing, you know, chess on a checkers board is really what I was trying to say. And so you are seeking feedback as to whether we feel like this is the, something that you should pursue ahead with. The feedback can be as simple as, Kyle, try to go find, you know, funding that you had in another CIP that didn't cost that much or work with Rodney or Jim to find that or maybe identify it in, in some other way. Um, but, yes, I'm, I'm basically what would looking. What did you say the total was? You think? Uh, well, their their first estimate came in at about $2 million. We have 1.2. Yeah, yeah. So that's simple. Kyle, please go find $2 million in other projects that you haven't spent. No, I only have to find 900000 I don't think I'm talented enough to find $2 million. Well, That's easier than the $2 million. Yeah. So. So just I walked better. into that one, didn't I? Yeah, walked right into that you, one. Yeah. You did. You have um, I just really want to make sure that the, the board supports the project and, and then we'll move forward and report back to the board on, on how we can. I support the project. Yes. Any usage numbers on the mini miniature golf out at Frank List? Not ball. off the top of my head, sorry. But it's pretty popular. Oh, yes. Very popular. Yes. Right? Yes. That's so why I was going to say, I feel like that's kind of an attraction, though. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. I hate to ride by and see it shut down. During the summer, you can expect 80 children a day on, on, on a weekend and the number of adults associated, but I don't have those numbers right off the top of my head, but as far as these are absolutely very popular. So you'll see this, um, I'm guessing timing-wise, this can be part of the FY24 budget. Mm -hmm. Um, so you'll see this as part of the budget process. Um, the most likely source of funding for this will be the money that we just transferred over to the CIF. So that $16 million is likely to be the source for this. I just found it. <laughs> Unless he's brilliant enough to find 900000 out of something he hasn't used. I think it's a challenge. But... Okay. Any Thank other you very much. questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We move now to item 4.15. Uh, Sherry Tillman from the Salisbury Rand Community Action Agency has very patiently waited <laughs> through the entire meeting. Uh, sorry that you made the, the bottom of the agenda. That's okay. I'm here. Welcome. So thank, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Sherry Tillman. I'm the program director for our self-sufficiency program at Salisbury Rand Community Action Agency. Um, we are anti-poverty agency. Um, which we are just one program under our SRCAA umbrella. Um, we serve as Cabarrus as well as Rowan County. Um, and I'm here today just to present our application for funding for the Community Services Block Grant for the 23-24 um, program year. And I have a little short presentation just to um, talk about the allocation as well as um, some services that we provide. It's very, very short. Salisbury Rowan Community Action Agency, or SRCAA, 
chartered in 1964 as an anti-poverty agency and approved in 1965 by the Office of Economic Opportunity as a community action agency, serves within a network that consists of more than 1,000 agencies that create, coordinate, and deliver programs and services to low-income Americans in 99% of the nation's counties. As part of the Community Action Network, SRCAA has the ability to mobilize additional resources to combat the central causes of poverty. Amongst those resources mobilized by the Salisbury Rowan Community Action Agency is the Self-Sufficiency Program, which is an anti-poverty program funded by the Federal Community Services Block Grant. The Self-Sufficiency Program provides both financial and comprehensive case management services to more than 100 families and individuals annually who reside in Rowand and Cabarrus County. Comprehensive services are provided in support of program participants obtaining employment, education and or vocational training, financial literacy, income management, and helping to eliminate barriers with issues such as homelessness, amongst other supportive services to aid in the achievement of becoming self-sufficient. Each year, the Community Services Block Grant receives an annual allocation determined by the United States Census Bureau and most current small area income and poverty estimates. The Salisbury Rowan Community Action Agency provides early childhood education through our Head Start, Early Head Start program, North Carolina Pre-K program, and our Early Learning Services Child Care Program. These programs promote school readiness while children experience hands-on learning through our STEM-focused preschool curriculum, which increases their social and cognitive development. Men of Action is a male involvement program that focuses on improving fathers' ability to be actively and positively involved in the lives of their children. The program combines curriculum-based education, case management services, and hands-on activities, all in an effort to strengthen families and further combat the continued causes of poverty. The Salisbury Rowan Community Action Agency has provided innovative and transformative services to struggling families for more than 55 years through our workforce development services and Head Start Early Head Start programs. The agency has been a partner in many community-wide initiatives that have increased capacity, created opportunities, and focused the anti-poverty efforts of the communities that SRCAA serves. To learn more about our programs, office locations, or how to apply for services, call 704-633-6633 or visit our website at www.srcaa.com. Thank you. Do you have any, are there any questions? But like I said, it's just to present the information and let you know that that's, this is what we're applying for, for funding, application for funding. And I think if I can. Correct, the, the funding that you receive is from grants. There's no county funding involved, right. but part of the requirement is that you. We have to present it, yes. Present to us. Just because it's coming into the county, right. you're correct. Any questions for Ms. Tillman? Okay. Okay. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. We move now to 4.16. So we didn't leave you exactly to last. We left Kelly Sifford <laughs> to last. So. Thank you. Unfortunately, Daniel couldn't be with us tonight since our night meeting night moved. It moved to their regular meeting night. So he is, he is at that meeting. Um, so quickly, uh, I thought probably I should tell you what a seed drill is because most people don't know. It is a farming piece of equipment that was obtained by the Soil and Water District a number of years ago through a grant. So um, originally the county didn't pay any money for it. Um, it is used uh, on a rental basis. And um, the fees that we have been charging for it are used to maintain the um, drill and hopefully put aside money each, each time we do it so that we can eventually buy a replacement at some point without hitting county funds. The process, unfortunately, at some point when this was adopted years ago, 
never came to the commissioners as best I can tell. <laughs> so it was approved by the Soil and Water Board. I think probably they were thinking because they owned it as part of the grant. It never came to the commissioners, but the funding does flow through us. So basically we just need to approve that. Um, we are requesting a slight increase um, from $10 an acre in county to $12 and $12 outside of the county to 15. Um, we did discover recently that our prices were a little lower than some of our neighbors, making it a little tempting for people outside the county to come to us. So this just kind of puts us on a level playing field with them. And um, so that is the request. Okay. Questions for Kelly. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Next up is the approval of our regular meeting agenda. And I do think there are some items on consent. 9, 11, and 18 are items that we did suspend the rules and approve tonight. Uh, so if there are no other adjustments, I would entertain a motion to approve the regular meeting agenda with the removal of items F9, F11, and F18. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Uh, we do have need of a closed session uh, tonight, which we did add to the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session to discuss pending lit litigation per North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3. Okay, let me, let me go grab my binders. So I move. Okay, well first let's finish this motion. Yes. I'll make a motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. We are now in closed session. Thank you all for joining us on television. <laughs>